All right, perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. This is the first episode of the Nate Shomer Show, so I'm very excited about this. And I'm here with Bethany Perdome. Correct. I said that correctly. Uh, so Bethany and I, we've trained together. She's a dog trainer that I've worked with in the past. She is phenomenal, so we're going to be talking about dog training, different things that people might run into when they're working with their dog, maybe some misconceptions that people have, and we're just going to have fun, and we're going to talk about dogs. So thank you so much, honestly, for taking the time to come mm-hmm. out or allowing us to come out to do the episode. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So what I want to do, I want to start right off with just hearing a little bit about your dog training philosophies and principles. I want people to be able to learn from this podcast and take something away from it. Okay. Um, So I've been training dogs professionally since 2010. Um, I used to live up in San Luis Obispo. Um, I have an old, well now she's almost 13, but she was a lab pit shepherd mix. Um, and I kind of got thrown into dog training because um, my dog actually attacked my friend's dog. She lived with the another small dog, so I thought she was fine. She went to the dog park. I didn't know any better. And uh, she just picked up the dog like a towel and just shook it and punctures and drains and everything. And I was kind of like, oh my gosh, what happened? And I was looking for a trainer. I couldn't really find anybody that I liked. Everybody there just wanted to shove treats in her face or, you know, be really hard on her. So I started studying and I went to a couple different schools. Um, I had an internship um, with a gentleman named Kenneth Brown up in San Luis Obispo who worked at the Woods Humane Society, worked with him for a couple years, moved back down to um, Orange County, worked at a place called Crossroads Pet Resort, then started my own business a few years back, and I've been working with PH Dogs ever since. What were the uh, dog training schools that you went to? I went through a program called Animal Behavior College, which saved your money. Um, I, I chose that program because I had an internship attached, um, but you really, if you know what you're looking for, just find a good dog trainer to study under because a lot of it just, you need the hands-on. Um, and I thought the program had a lot, the, the internship was a lot longer than it was. Um, so I don't really recommend that program anymore. Um, but I did go through that and that's how I got the internship, which I was very thankful for. And I learned a lot working under, um, Ken Brown up in San Luis Obispo. Um, and then working with the shelter up there, Woods Humane Society. Um, you have a few other certifications, though. That I'm yeah, aware so of, right? I have the at Crossroads. They had us get the like the certification council of professional dog trainers, and you have to go and take like a three hundred or four hundred question test. Um, and it's from a third party, so it's not like their program certifies you. It's a, a third party, so they have no interest in whatever program, and it tests you on ethology and learning theory and, um, you know, different sicknesses and things like that. And then if you pass, then you get certified. Um, but unfortunately the, the bad thing about dog training is that there are no certifications. So you don't have to be certified to be a dog trainer. So Joe Schmo could go out tomorrow and print out business cards and all of a sudden he's a dog trainer. So it makes it hard if you are looking for a dog trainer to find somebody who actually knows what they're doing because you have to kind of shift through all kinds of Bad mm. trainers who will take your money and leave your dog off worse than you brought them in. So uh, cheap necessarily not is not necessarily better. Um, you, if you're going to have a good dog trainer, you're going to spend a little bit of money for it. Mm-hmm. And it's not that there are no certifications. There are certifications, but it's not a regulated not, industry. Exactly. You don't have it's to like have – yeah. it's not licensed. It's not regulated. Um, you can get certifications, but they're not required. So somebody who, just like you said, may have had – pet dogs their entire life and they believe they're an expert because they've had their pet dogs or they've had a couple even German shepherds for some reason people assume that they had a German shepherd they have more of an expertise level than somebody who had a golden yeah now they're dishing out advice and they're offering up services to people and that's the problem with the dog training industry you could go get your haircut and ask your barber what you should do about your dog that jumps up they're going to give you advice Mm -hmm. The, the problem is they have you know the expertise of working with maybe their five dogs that they grew up with in their whole life I have you know, more than 500 dogs that I've trained. So dog training is really, it's, it's based in science, but there's also a big art portion of, you know, it's all opera and classical conditioning, but know when to use what with which dog to get the results that this person can follow through it. That's the art of it. Just because I can walk with a clicker and food and use a remote collar or a pinch collar or a flexi or a harness or you know, whatever doesn't mean that you can, you know, for some puppies, they jump up, I say, turn your back, ignore it. Well, guess what? If the owner is, you know, eight years old and her puppy is a nine month old Great Dane, that lady's going to go flying when she turns her back. So you can't use that same method for each dog. So you have to, again, you have to know the science behind the whys, but you also have to have that art portion to know, 
to know what to use with each person and which, with each dog to help them reach their goals. And this is actually a really important conversation to have, and I'm glad you brought it up too, because a lot of people do run into those issues where they have a problem. And this is something that scares me with a lot of situations that somebody might have. They might have a dog that has issues and they contact a professional dog trainer, at least according to the person's website. Professional dog trainer. Exactly right. And then they go to this professional dog trainer and this dog trainer is not able to help them with the dog. And as a consequence of that, this dog ends up in a shelter because the person says, well, I hired a trainer. It didn't work out. So obviously we can't fix the dog. It's the dog's fault. And they take the dog to the shelter. So what could people do in order to effectively find the right dog trainer? What certain things that you would recommend based on your experience? Because, you know, we want this to reach everybody within the country. So there's going to be people in different locations. What's a good way for them to find somebody that can help them with their issue? Don't be selfish. That's... I, I don't remember who posted it, but somebody was saying the biggest problem with, and it was on Facebook, so I can't remember who it was, but I'd love to give them credit if I could think of it. Um, they said, you know, what's the biggest mistake or what's the biggest problem that people have with their dogs? And it's they're selfish. People are selfish. They want to feel good training their dog. Well, the world's not full of rainbows and butterflies and unicorns. You know, sometimes it's not, you can't always use just positive reinforcement with every single dog. Some dogs you can. If you start that puppy at eight weeks old, I can do almost everything and get that dog totally off leash. Um, If I have that dog motivated, I can use food. I can use, you know, just a flat collar or a harness in food, and I can get that dog to be phenomenal. You give me that dog that's eight months old that's been in the shelter, who hasn't been bonded, who's been bounced from house to house to house, who has learned to just drag through their leash, who has learned to jump all over people, who has learned to self-reinforce and to self-reward. You can't do the same thing. That's a totally different, a clean slate puppy versus a dog that has had so many inconsistencies. So don't get trapped in a method. Just because, you know, purely positive doesn't work for you and your dog does not mean that you're a bad person for going outside that box. There's also a difference between being firm but fair and being abusive. You know, being there's definitely trainers who are abusive, um, but you're not going to get results being abusive. It's you know, there's, there's a difference. There's a fine line. Again, that goes back to the art of the dog training. It's knowing what does this dog want? Um, you know, and a lot of times where people fail is when you don't have something that's as rewarding as the environment. So I always use squirrels for an example. You get a dog that loves chasing squirrels. You can use chicken, you can use hot dogs, you can use whatever food you want. You're never going to have something as exciting as chasing that squirrel. You're not. Well, guess what? You're not allowed to get hit by a car. Right? It's, for me, that's the non-negotiable. You're not allowed to run out in the street. You're not allowed to chase that cat. You're not allowed to attack that dog. I'm sorry. I'm really mean, but those things you're not allowed to do. So even if I can't get you to do it using positive reinforcement, I go, well, yeah, you have to, but it's also worth your while. So the first time I'm doing come one called, for example, I'm not going to go where there's 1,500 squirrels running around, right? That's setting the dog up to fail. We're going to do it in the backyard. We're going to go to the park where there's no squirrels. We're going to do it when the dog is hungry. Then I'm going to teach the dog, you know, with a leash and teach them, you know, even when you don't want to come, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. And then you get to go back out and sniff. Then I'm going to go where there's, you know, squirrels. And I'm going to go, well, you still have to come when you're called. But if you do, now you get to go chase the squirrels again if the dog is able to. So it's kind of like you, you have to check in with me and then you can have what you want. But you can't do it on your own. You have to go through me. So it's good to have the full balance, of course, depending on which dog. We talked a little bit about the science and then the art is being able to use the science correctly in order to get the results based on that individual dog. So if we have somebody who's calling us or calling you Mm -hmm. and they're in, let's say, Missouri, Mm -hmm. right, or Chicago or whatever, they're on the Midwest and they're asking you, it's a friend of yours, and they Mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm looking at different dog trainers. I have four that are in the area. Mm -hmm. They all seem pretty good. What could I look at to try to determine which one's best or what would you recommend your friend? Would you say talk to each one or... Um, I know it's a tough it's, question. <laughs> you, usually I look for um, them doing some kind of outside competition. So do they have the passion that outside of their normal pet dogs, do they do this for fun also? Um, like I do a sport called French ring. French ring is obedience, protection, and agility. So the, the pet dogs is kind of my bread and butter. I don't make any money off the ring sport stuff, but that's my passion. So at the end of the day, when I'm done training the pet dogs, I go train my own dogs. That's what I want to look for in a dog trainer. I want to look at the trainer's dogs. A lot of, you'll notice, uh, the trainers have poorly behaved dogs. Does their dog know sit? Will their their dog come when called? If their dog won't come when called, how do I expect them to train my dog to come when called? Um, Also, a lot of people have Malinois as a demo dog. 
will, if you know what you're doing, they're super easy to train. They're very motivated and they're very easy. Show me a beagle. Show me a husky. Show me a dog that's not easy to work with. Let me see that, that eight-month-old rescue dog. Let me see that dog working. Um, because that's going to show you that that trainer knows how to modify their methods to, to re- help every dog, not just the dog that fits their training methods. Um, so look for a trainer who is, you know, goes above and beyond, who trains outside of, of the normal pet dog training. Um, you can look for certifications. For me, that's not the end of the world. I want experience. Um, you know, doing it for at least a couple years. If they work with a rescue group, great. Um, referrals are always great. So I do no advertising. All of my advertising is Yelp. I don't pay for it, but Yelp and word of mouth. So ask your friends. If you have a friend who has a very well-behaved dog, hey, did you train your dog or did you, you know, have somebody train your dog? Um, you can, you know, call your AKC club and see if they have, uh, you know, a competition obedience club. You can go on Yelp if you want. Um, but look, look to see if they've worked with a dog like yours before. Um, and just because they have doesn't mean that they're a good trainer too. So there's all kinds of, it depends, but I I really want to see them going above and beyond. I want to see the passion. I want to see the results. A lot of people get stuck on methods, but methods don't train dogs. Mm -hmm. Results do. So I want to see, can they actually get the results? Can they get a dog that's off leash trained? If that's your goal, ask for a video of them training other dogs. If they have a Facebook page, go on their Facebook, look up to see if they've got pictures or videos of, of other dogs and that you like what you see. Um, and then kind of go from there. It's also a lot of it just on feeling. Do you, ha- do you have a good relationship with them? If, if you aren't real comfortable with them or if you have a bad vibe, you're less likely to go to the training. Um, so just there's a lot of it depends, but would you look say for a crazy that... dog person. <laughs> <laughs> would you say there's any red flags that if you say, okay, if I see this, that's something I would suggest avoiding? Um. Yeah, I mean, look look at the tools that they have. Um, you know, if if you see, for me, look at the body language of the dog. I think that's number one. So if they give you a demo dog, what does that dog look like? Are they doing everything really flat? Are th- is their tail tucked? Is their ears pinned back? Do they look like they have a great relationship with their handler? Are they, you know, tail wagging? Are they excited? Are they motivated to work? That's what I want to see. Um, I don't necessarily care about what methods they use. I want to see results, and I want to see that the dog is... Uh, happy but reliable that's what I want I really like that you said that too about the results because I think results really matters and what I've come across with people and you probably had the same situation somebody might call you up and they have a certain problem they want you to fix Mm -hmm. so for example let's do the come when called somebody Mm -hmm. calls you up and they say you know I have this dog Uh, I've done obedience with it for a long time it'll sit it'll down it'll do things like that but we cannot get it to come when called when it is off leash it does whatever the dog wants to do it takes off and at that point they tried treats, they tried whatever it is that they can try. What would you recommend for something like that? The, the first thing I tell people is stop punishing your dog for coming. Mm. A lot of people don't realize that they do it, but they punish their dog all the time. They're at the dog park, what do they do? Fido, come. The dog comes, they put on the leash, they leave the park. You just punished your dog. You just ended playtime and that dog finally came to you. Do you think he's going to come next time? Mm-hmm. Maybe come one or two times. Third time, he's not going to want to come when you call him at the dog park because you just end playtime. Um, second thing they do is the dog's outside going potty, barking at the neighbor dog. Fido come. The dog comes. They put him inside. They close the door. Again, you took away playtime. The dog want, it's gonna, is the dog gonna, is the dog going to want to come next time? Nope. Same thing. The dog is, you know, you tell the dog to come. You stick him in their crate. Stop punishing the dog for coming when called. So I do a lot of catch and release. Catch the dog, give him a couple treats, give him the toy, scratch the butt, send him out to play again. Let them go chase that squirrel again. Let them know it's just a check-in. Work on collar grabs too. A lot of people only grab the dog's collar, again, when they're going to hook a leash on it. So then you get that, that keep away. Because they know that when you grab their collar, it's either you're going to take something out of their mouth, you're going to hook them up, and you're going to end play time. So number one is stop punishing your dog for coming when called. If you stop doing that and you start rewarding them, you're going to see a huge difference. And for me, that's the number one. Second is don't give commands that you're not willing and able to follow through with. If you know that your dog is barking at the neighbor dog, you know, in fence fighting or is digging a hole and you call him and he's not going to come, don't call him. All he learns is to blow you off. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's no point. All he learns is that come doesn't mean come. So if you're not willing and able to follow through, don't tell him come. You can go, puppy, 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 clap your hands, whatever, but keep that special recall word for when you can actually follow through. So more of an informal, you're saying, if you're not wanting to follow through, like, yep. hey, come on, puppy, so if they yep. don't listen, it's not like it was a command. Nope. 
right? And then that actually makes, we were talking about it on the drive out here. A lot of times people will communicate with their dog in a negative way accidentally, like unaware of it. You know, for example, based on what you're saying, the dog will be running around and kind of blowing the owner off. Mm -hmm. And the dogs or the human is getting frustrated that the dog's not coming. And then when they finally get the dog, what do they do? They correct them. They literally get mad. So not even just putting them in the crate. They yell at them. They correct them, whatever. And now the dog goes, whoa, coming to you is a bad thing. I see that all the time for dogs that run out the front door. The people get so upset. First, they chase the dog, so they turn into a game. Right? It's really fun when owners chase you and you get to play catch me mm-hmm. if you can. Then they finally do get caught. And what do they do? They yell at them. They grab my the car. Hey, you're such a bad dog. And then they're like, oh, okay, you better not get caught next time. And now you have this, you turn into this game. This game is run out the front door as fast as you can. Then mom comes flailing arms and yelling at you. You hope the dog doesn't get hit by a car. And then you correct the dog when you finally catch them. So it's pretty much everything is wrong in that situation. Miscommunication is probably the biggest thing. And we can probably name hundreds of incidences where this happened. Even, for example, a dog not outing something. The person gets frustrated when they finally get the item from the dog. They smack the dog. So now the dog literally learns, hold on to this thing as hard as I can because when I let go. So that timing. Now, uh, how important. Let's talk about timing. How important it is for people to understand how timing works with dog training and how they need to understand and implement it when they are working with their dogs. So it's actually a, a double-edged sword. So people, um, timing is very important, but you also have time if you use markers. So a lot of people go, yes, and they're moving at the same time. What is a marker? Let's define so, that for the audience. So markers, it's a bridge. So you're, you're making... Um, a conditioned reinforcer, so a click or a yes or potato, it doesn't matter what it is, followed by um, something good, if you're going to use it as a positive um, reinforcement marker. So it'd be click, you reach in your pocket, you give the food. Click, you reach in your pocket, you give the food. Now the click is predicting something good happening. So if the dog sits, yes or click, I reach in my pocket, I give the reward. The same thing goes for a negative reinforcement marker, right? So the dog jumps up, I go, no. I walk over, I grab the dog's leash, I give him a tug off that person. So you don't have to go, no, and be running towards the person, or yes, and be reaching at the same time, because now yes doesn't mean yes, this means yes. And so then the dogs get excited when they hear their wrapper opening, not your voice. You always have your voice. And now Use some your people voice. are just going to be listening to this, so you have to explain what you were doing. Oh, I was, reaching, be... I was reaching into my bait bag for the yes. At the same time. Yes, you don't want to do that. And that's important. So the, the markers always come first, followed by the movement for either a punishment or a reward. But you, you have time. A lot of people are like, oh, hurry up, you've only got two seconds. No, you don't. Take a young puppy, put him in the car, drive to the vet, give him shots. You want to do that two or three times before the puppy does not want to get in that car. Mm-hmm. And guess what? You've got 15, 20 minutes between there. But because nothing happens between, they can make that association. So you have time. Relax. Mark it. Click it. Say no. Whatever. Then move and, and give your punishment or your reward. When should somebody be marking? And how does somebody teach a marker to their dog? If somebody is listening to this and they want to implement some of these techniques. So you want to charge the marker. So charging the marker means making that association or pairing it. So it's really simple. Click, reach in your pocket, give the treat. Click, reach in your pocket, give the treat. Click, reward. Click, reward. Wait a couple seconds. Click, reward. So you, you want to make sure it's not just click reward, click reward, click reward, click reward, or else the dog just is like, oh, cool, this is awesome. You want those kind of um, delays so that way the dog's like, how come I'm not getting anything? Click, oh, that's what predicts a reward. Um, and you want to do that before you even start the behaviors. So generally count out 50 treats. That's enough for most dogs to make the associate, association between um, the click and something good happening. Um, and that's classical conditioning. So that's the Pavlov. That's ringing the bell. That's the dog salivating, anticipating the food is going to happen. Um, the dinner bell theory. A lot exactly. of people are familiar with that. Yep. And it is important to note the whole thing because that's something I run into often. I know you run into it as well. Is And we all do it because it's so hard not to pair your physical with your verbal because it's natural. As we talk, Mm -hmm. we move with our our mouth, essentially. And so to be able to separate it, so everyone just really needs to be aware of that, making sure the sound comes first. And it's so important because if you are pairing it together, if they're saying, if they're clicking as they give the dog the food, according to... You're not making it. Yep. They're not making it. And again, you've got time. So click one Mississippi, reach in your pocket reward. You have time. You don't have to hurry up and, and between the click and the reward to give the dog the food. You have time. So click one Mississippi reach reward. 
you have the time. There's no reason to be moving and clicking at the same time. And you've trained all kinds of different dogs. So you've trained pet dogs. I, you train search and rescue as well, right? Service dogs, yep. protection dogs. Now with each one of these dogs, is there any dog that you skip the step of teaching them markers or is that hands down across the board? You do it on all of them. I start pretty much all my puppies the same way. It's, and that's just learning to learn. So if you have, if you have those markers, the dog understands. I, so I use my verbal markers. I'll use a clicker or a yes for good you know, as a, as a positive reinforcement. Um, I use good for duration. And then I use no as my, my pairing with a correction. Um, and as long as the dogs understand yes, good, and no, you can teach them anything. Um, and once the dogs learn how to learn, training is super easy. So a lot of times my, my first behaviors I'll do is I'll start, you know, a little bit of healing, just following a food lure. So that's just taking the food, sticking it straight on the puppy's nose and having them follow it. They don't have to do anything but just keep their, their nose on the food. The, the problem that a lot of people make with that beginning step is they go too fast. So you want to keep that puppy's nose right on the, on the food. They move their hand too fast? Yep. Okay. Yeah, and they lose the dog. So I see that a lot, like for the down, they go down and they lose the dog's nose and they wonder why the dog didn't down. So you want to keep the treat on the dog's nose and lure them into the down. The second those elbows touch, I'll mark it, yes, or a click, I'll open my hand, I'll give the food. So same thing for a sit, food is to the nose. When the nose goes up, the butt tends to go down. The second that butt hits the ground, I mark it, I open my hand, I feed the dog. You can do spins, you can do healing. If you have a dog that'll follow a food lure, you can do roll over, you can teach bow, you can teach pretty much anything. It's all just follow the food lure. Um, and after that, I also, one of my beginning um, things that I teach the dog is uh, free shaping or learning through successive approximation. Um, and that's, I'll use a target for that. And I do nothing, I just stand there with my clicker, they look at the target, I click and I reward. They go to sniff it, I click and I reward. I do absolutely nothing um, except for telling the dog, you're warmer, you're warmer, you're warmer. Um, and my goal is for the dog to offer the behavior of putting their feet on something. So that's the dog learning to manipulate me. Again, that's operant conditioning is the dog's behavior drives my behavior. They offer a look, they offer a touch, they offer movement. That's what gets me to click and to reward them. So I'm not doing anything. I have no help at all. They have to learn to train me pretty much. And that's operant conditioning. And that actually does more than just getting the dog to, in a sense, get you to do certain behaviors. So their behavior controls the environment, yep. in a sense, which builds their confidence. But it's something that I've ran into with many different clients that I work with, and I always end up explaining it to them, of course. But everybody wants to be able to have the dog that just listens just to listen, yep. right? They don't, they're like, well, the dog should listen to me because I'm its master and it's mm -hmm. supposed to listen, right? And it's like, well, do you work for free, right? Because they often ask, do I always have to pay my dog? Mm -hmm. Now, how do you teach somebody to start bridging, or not bridging, but rather spacing out the rewards or minimizing the amount of rewards that they give the dog while still getting the dog to perform? And what's going on in the dog's mind that gets them to willingly perform these behaviors, even though they're not always getting a treat? And you used a great analogy when we were talking about this before, and I use it with everybody now. Mm -hmm. Let's see if you can remember I which remember analogy we we're talking about. So I... <laughs> I, for me, my rule is if it's a piece of cake. So the, the first thing is get the behavior. If you don't have the behavior reliable, one, you can't name it yet. So I tell people don't name it until you love it. So like I was saying for the sit and luring the dog into that position, unless I can get my dog, and again, I do competition obedience, so I want them square. I don't want them flopping on one hip. I want them, you know, with their butt tucked in, sitting straight. Until I can get them to sit how I want to, I don't name it. So I might do 30, 40 reps, or it might go a whole week with getting a behavior that I don't name yet because I don't want to add the cue until I like the behavior. Because if I start naming sit and I start clicking for it, but I've got a sloppy sit, now I just started rewarding something that I don't want. So I don't add the cue until I'm, I'm sure that I have the behavior that I want. And a lot of people start doing sit, you know, and adding the right word away. right away. Exactly. And the problem with that is if the dog doesn't do it, now you just said sit, 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 and the dog hasn't done it. Now you're, you know, the, the word means nothing to the dog anymore. So it's a lot easier get the behavior than throw the cue on it once you have it exactly how, how you like it. Um, and I lost track of the original question. The question was um, still getting the dog to perform oh, okay. the behavior but not having to reward the dog for every behavior. Okay. So my, my kind of general rule is if it's a piece of cake, you don't need to reward it. You so had a if, great analogy, though, you told me before, and I use it all the time. So 
when you start I have off, lots of great analogies. When you <laughs> and analogies are important in dog training because it really helps people understand it, and it's a beautiful analogy. Everybody I've told it to is like that makes a lot of sense. So you said when you first start off working with a dog, you want to be a vending machine, mm-hmm. and then as the dog progresses, you want to turn it into. Are you sure remember? that was me? Yeah, that was you. A slot machine. Okay. Well, that was most that's, definitely that's you. That's true. And I and I tell <laughs> How people. How do you oh, do that though? Okay, so the difference between the vending machine and the slot machine is. When you're playing slots, you expect to put a lot of money in and only win every once in a while, right? Or sometimes you don't even win. You just like playing the game. With the vending machine, if you put money in and you push that button and it doesn't come out, you're going to get pissed. Mm -hmm. You're expecting to get a reward. So you have a different reaction. You put the same thing. You put in 50 cents in a vending machine. You don't get that reward. You have a bad association. So you're either going to try kicking it. You might shake it. You might push it a couple times because you're upset because you're expecting to get something out of that. With the, vent, or the slot machine, you're expecting not to win. And every once in a while, you hit that jackpot. And so because you have the expectation of not getting something, and then you do get it, and you're like, that's fantastic, versus expecting to get something and not getting it. So, And, and that's just, again, that's you have to switch to a variable rate of reinforcement pretty quickly, and a lot of people get stuck on that continuous. Um, and what's a good way to switch? How What have you seen that's an effective way? And I know... There's, it's, it's really an art, so each dog is going to vary. But what would be a good way to generalize it for a large group of people to where they're going to have the 80%. most success? Once you have 80% success rate, you can start changing it up. Um, and, and, again, you want to you wanna vary it. So, um, like, if I'm fading, I'm doing my sit, and I have my hand signal or I'm still using my food lure, I'm not going to switch to a hand signal away from the food lure until I have an 80% success rate. I'm not going to switch away from a hand signal to just a verbal until I have that 80%. I'm not going to start um, asking, switching over to life rewards until I have that 80%. Um, and life rewards are, okay, you want to go for a walk? You need to sit before I put your leash on. You know, your leash is your reward since they have that association between leash and walk. You want to go outside the potty? Do a down first. Okay, going outside is a reward. You want to come out of the car? You need to stay first. So you're, you're switching them over away from food and onto life rewards, things that you always have, things that the dog wants. So, and, and that's just kind of, again, I use the 80% rule. And for food, I use the, you know, piece of cake. If it's really easy, you don't need to reward the dog. If it was, you called the dog to come and he was chasing a squirrel and he came and you're like, wow, that was really nice, pay him for it. You know, make him know that, that you know, that's his Christmas bonus. Make sure that he knows that you're really happy with his work. I like that you use the term life reward. I actually never heard that before, but that's a good way to put it. And that also, I would imagine it makes or it adds value to those commands yep. because now it's what the commands are predicting. And something I often say when I'm working with somebody, I say, always think about what the dog is predicting. What does each behavior, what is it that happens within your routine with your dog that predicts certain things? And whatever these things predict will end up adding value to those things. So if the sit predicts going out on a walk, the dog ends up enjoying a sit. Yep. Right now, they're going to start offering that up to try to get a walk. Oh, here's a good one. What is your thoughts? So this is something people often say. And for me, I always have to um, explain to them really what's going on. Because how often does somebody say, and I'm sure you've heard it hundreds of times, uh, my dog begs. Mm -hmm. Right? So at least the way I look at it is if a dog sits and looks up at you while you're eating dinner, Mm -hmm. the dog is offering up a behavior. If you've done any sort of obedience using doggy treats Mm -hmm. to sit in order to get that reward, and now they come up to you and they offer a behavior and they go, you have food. Mm-hmm. The last time you had food, I sat, mm-hmm. you gave me a piece. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going to sit now and now you're going to give me a piece, right? Isn't that the deal yep. we worked out? With with my dogs, yes, but not everybody wants a dog to be sitting and staring at them while they're eating. So again, give them something else to do. So I use, you can't see my dogs, but I have two old dogs that are asleep on their beds right now. So my dogs know because I like to spoil my dogs that when we're done eating, you get to either lick the plate or I'll give you something. I always save them a little tidbit of whatever, but they have to stay on their beds. If they're on their beds, they can't be drooling on my leg. They can't be trying to steal things from me. They can't be, you know, going under the table and bugging guests. I don't have to worry about guests feeding my dog while we're eating. So I give them something else to do where, yes, I can still reward them at the end for the behavior, but I don't have to worry about the dog now drooling in anticipation that they're going to get fed at the table. So, yes, they are offering a nice behavior, but not everybody likes to be stared at Mm. while they're eating. So I prefer to use the place command or climb or whatever you want to call it, of go to your bed, lay down, and stay um, while we're eating. Because I I also don't like guests to feed my dogs, and a lot of people will feed them at the table. And so if they're away from the the table, I don't have to worry about the dog eating something if somebody dropped something or, you know, 
the drunk uncle feeding the dog something they shouldn't have because they're away from the table. Well, can there be a negative consequence that could come about with somebody who's trying to teach their dog how to behave and they don't understand necessarily how dogs think or how they process information and the dog comes over and does the begging, as mm-hmm. people call it, and that person corrects the dog for begging and then wonders why later the dog doesn't want to do a sit. So, so the first thing you have to do is what, figure out what you want. If you don't know what you want, how the heck is the dog supposed to know? They're not mind readers. All they know is what work has worked in the past. So like you mm-hmm. said, they offer that sit. Why? Because it's worked in the past. If they think about jumping up on somebody and they sit, they get rewarded. Why wouldn't they reward for offering a sit here? And so then if it you could don't, confuse them if you correct them, though. Sure. Right? I don't want to correct my dog for offering a nice, calm behavior, but I also don't want them doing it. So what do I do? I give them something else to do. Again, if you don't know how you want your dog to greet guests, how's your dog supposed to know? Mm-hmm. If you don't know how your dog, how you want your dog to act during dinner time, how is your dog supposed to know? So that's something, especially when you've got multiple people in the family, everybody has to be on the same page. So everybody has to decide, okay, are we going to let the dog on the couch or not? Because if one person does and the other person doesn't, it's not fair to the dog. Sometimes they get up and they get cuddles and kisses and sometimes they get kicked off the couch. Not fair. So make up your mind, what do you want your dog to do, and then reward them accordingly or correct them accordingly. But if you don't know what you want, your dog's not a mind reader unless it's lassie. Tell them what you want and then reward it. And going off of that, is it bad for somebody to let their dog go on their bed or let their dog, because people hear, you know, oh, well, the dog's going to believe they're alpha, so I can't do this or I can't do that. So for me, it's not a problem unless it's a problem. I have an old dog who sleeps in bed with me. She's 13 years old. She's been sleeping with me since she was a puppy. It's not a problem. Why? Because if I tell her to get off, she'll get off. If she's sleeping and I bump her, she's not going to growl at me. So a lot of people let the dog, dogs that shouldn't be on the couch, dogs that don't wait for permission. So for me, everything has to have rules with it. So I don't want my dog just launching on the couch because they want on the couch. So unless I do two taps, my dog doesn't come up. That's her cue or her invitation is I two, two taps, the dog comes up. Because not everybody wants a dog on the couch. If you have a party and there's people sitting on the couch or somebody's eating an appetizer on the couch and all of a sudden the dog is right there and they don't like dogs, well, one, get out of my house because my dogs rule. (laughs) But number two, I have to have manners. Because if that person doesn't want and I like that person, would like them to stay, I need to be able to say, okay, go to your bed and stay. But if that dog just jumps on the couch and then I try to get the dog off and it growls at me, okay, well, you lose that privilege because you're not behaving yourself. So if I have a dog that growls if I try to get them off the couch, who if I bump them, they growl at me or won't get off when I tell them to, they haven't earned that privilege. That's a good way to put it, too. It's as long as it's not a problem, then it's fine. But once it becomes a problem. So, yeah, I mean, because I I do this. I have three dogs. They all sleep on the bed with me. None of them walk around thinking they're the alpha, you know, or any of that stuff. And something I constantly try to pushed on people that have dogs and they have questions about dogs not push on them but you know what i mean is understand the science Mm -hmm. right understand how dogs think and how they process information then you can perfect the art and that's kind of what we were talking about before using the right motivation factors for the dogs or using the right uh correction level for the dog so if somebody is working with their dog they're new they're just starting how did they decide what is going to be the best motivation factors how can they decide what would be the best boundaries and how to set them up appropriate for that dog? Are there easy ways for them to tell? So going back to the whole bed thing real quick, I just wanted to insert this. Um, the whole being dominant or being you alpha. Can walk around. It's fine. Don't even and and uh, <laughs> being dominant or being alpha over your dog and you know alpha rolling and things like that. A real alpha dog just gives a look and the other dog offers the submissive mm. behavior. A real alpha dog is not standing over and pinning other dogs. They're too confident for that. They, they don't do that. If, if they walk up, the other dog will offer that submissive position. They don't instill it. Second thing is, is um, so dominance is priority access to limited or valuable resources. That's what, a dom- that's what, that's what that is. Wait, say it one more time. I like how you put that. It's, so being dominant is priority access to limited or valuable resources. So if you have three dogs and there's one bone and the dogs got into a fight, that would be a fight over dominance. Mm. Because if you also watch some dogs, one dog can just walk up and take that bone if they know their place in the hierarchy. Yes, hierarchies do exist in dogs. When you have an issue is when dogs think they're the same place on the hierarchy. That's the same with people. And, and, they, and they both <laughs> want that same thing at the same time. So for some dogs, it's uh, sleeping places. 
some dogs, sometimes it's food, sometimes it's people. Affection can be a resource. So, like, if I'm petting one dog and one dog comes up and they get into a fight, that's a fight over dominance. She wanted whatever dog that was guarding wanted that resource to themselves. Now, so, so that's what that is. So if a dog is pulling you on your walk, it's not being dominant. If they're rushing through the front door before you, it's not being dominant. Your dog doesn't have manners. Dominance is priority access to limited resources or valuable resources. So same thing, the dog is sleeping on the couch. You go to move them and the dog growls at you, that's dominance. Mm. That's saying, I want to keep what's mine. You need to back off. So that's, you know, same thing. If your dog is guarding uh, food and um, a, as long as you haven't created the problem by harassing your dog while they're eating and, you know, you go to take something away and the dog, you know, goes after you, again, that can be dominance as well because they're saying, I should be the one. I'm the alpha. This is mine. I'm going to keep it. Um, so Let's that's... cover that a little bit with the food. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a lot of people run into. And I believe that sometimes it can be genetic. Sometimes it can be oh, genetics course. for the dog to mm -hmm. have that food aggression or that resource guarding. But how is it that a lot of people actually cause food aggression on their dogs? So um, dogs do what works. So a, a lot of pet people are fantastic at making personal protection dogs in a, in, inadvertently, okay? Right. <laughs> so again, dogs do whatever works. So staying on the topic of the resource guarding, it's normal for puppies. A lot of people think you make aggression. No, all dogs have aggression in them. It's a natural fight or flight. You don't create something. It's already there. So when people say that punishing your dog creates aggression, no, it does not. The dog's just not used to being told no or them not getting their own way. Um, so you're not going to make your dog aggress. You're not going to bring out it. You're not going to cause aggression. You might just bring it out. Mm. So it's always there. Um, and I've got two little puppies here right now that I'm sure if I put a raw bone between them, they're going to fight over it. But most of the time when they're very young and they're with their mother, they're learning boundaries. They're learning. No, they're learning to take correction. They learn all of that from their mom and their litter mates. So that's why it's super important. If you can do not take a puppy that's younger than eight weeks. So most of the time when I have dogs that have issues with like guarding or aggression or, you know, really serious problems, it's usually a dog that's poorly bred and has been taken away from mom too young and hasn't been socialized. So keep the puppies with their mom until at least eight weeks or at least with the pup litter mates until at least eight weeks. Um, and then in terms of guarding, so with puppies when they're super young, so I have two six week old puppies right now, I'm starting guarding now. So I'll give them a very high value bone. I'm gonna reach my hand and take it away. Why? Because if they bite me, they're six weeks old. Nothing is gonna happen. What am I gonna do? Even if they bite me, I'm gonna give them a piece of raw hamburger meat. Then I'm gonna give it back to them. I'm gonna do it again. So that way they learn number one, aggression doesn't work. And again, you can only do this with really small puppies or else you're gonna get bit pretty bad. Yeah. But, um, so I take that bone away. I don't care if they throw a fit. I'm gonna give them something that's even better. Then I'm going to give it back to them. I'm going to do that again and again. And what's going to happen is that dog is going to see me reaching and he's going to anticipate I'm going to give him something good. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to guard because I'm not taking it away. I'm just trading for a second and then he gets it back. So I'm not getting into that fight because I'm not fighting with the dog. I'm just all business. I take it away. I give you something fantastic and I give it back to you. Why wouldn't that dog like me taking it away? Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, if every time the dogs ate, I mess with them, it's going to get old real quick. So if you're eating steak and every time I'm sticking my fork on your plate, sticking my fork on your plate, eventually you're like, just leave me alone. Let me eat in peace, right? Mm -hmm. I overdid it. If every once in a while I said, hey, let me try some of that. Oh, do you want to try my chicken too? You're more likely to trade. But at the same time, if I keep poking the bear while they're eating, eventually you can, you can piss them off enough where they're going to react. Um, so number one, if it's an adult dog, let them eat alone. Feed them in the crate. Yes, leave, thank you. leave them alone. <laughs> you know, if, if I'm eating dinner, don't start bugging me. I want to just eat my food in peace. Same thing with your dog. Um, and by feeding them in the crate too, that teaches the dog you eat in your crate. You don't eat it off the table or things like that. And they like their crate because that's where they get fed all the time. So you're making a nice positive association with the crate. Um, don't let your kids bug dogs, you know, when they have a bone. It's, you know, don't do it. You know, in the olden days, it used to be if the dog growled at the kid, hey, leave the dog alone. They have a bone. And now it's, oh, there's something wrong with the dog. Mm -hmm. What changed? Yep. You know, our expectations. Don't don't think that your dog is going to be uh, more tolerant than you are. Right? It's it's not fair for the dog. We have this all these unrealistic expectations with, you know, with guarding. If you have a million dollars and every time I took your wallet, I took money out, you're not going to want to give me your wallet anymore. If every time I took your wallet, I added 100 bucks, you're not going to mind if I take your wallet every once in a while, right? So 
some things that people can do at home is you have a thing of food with the puppy, take it away, add a dollop of wet food, give it back. Do it once a week. Don't do it every day. Don't mess with the dog. Don't pull them by the tail. Don't mess with them. You know, you can do two pets and again, throw in some more wet food, leave it alone. Don't push it or else you're going to make problems. And that could create the aggression because people have this, it's been pushed on society so much, at least in the United States, that you have to be the alpha, you have to be the pack leader. And people think that it's a good thing to take the food away, to show the dog that they are the dominant one. Yeah, and then you turn and into then a bully. They, then they create, that creates a resource guard. And then to go back what you said about, and this is important to note uh, because some people may not fully get what you're saying as far as you take, you put your hand on the bone that the puppy has, the puppy may act aggressive. Mm -hmm. And when you take it away, the moment that the puppy is no longer actively being aggressive towards your hand, literally the second the dog stops, that's when you give them the food. Yep. So it's important that, you're not giving them the food when they're acting aggressive because then you can reward them. But a lot of times people you think won't, that. You won't though. Yeah. But I mean, what I say is a lot of people, uh, they think that it has to be like this long time frame, no. you know, from when one thing is. It's like literally if you, for example, if you correct a dog, mm -hmm. after I finish the correction, I'm immediately rewarding the dog for doing the right thing. It's yep. not a dragged out thing. A correction is boom that quick. Yep. And then I'm immediately rewarding the dog for the right behavior. And that's part of that clear communication. Yep. And, and I tell people too, I said, you know, whenever you're with your dog, you have to be kind of bipolar. One minute it's a no, and next it's yay. Yep. You have to make that flip. You have to be crazy like that, because the that's dog a good is, way to put it too. The dog is making the wrong choice one second, and they're right the next. Mm -hmm. Let them know when they're bad and when they're good, because if you're not telling them, they're not mind readers. They don't know. And our society has a totally different view of what is good and what's bad than dogs do. So mm -hmm. if you're not telling them what's good and bad. How are they supposed to know? That's a brilliant way of putting it. I never heard that one too, being bipolar with the dog. That is a good way to do it because you can't, dogs don't hold grudges, right? So corrections that quick. And then just like you said, it should instantly be, once they're doing it right, immediately. I mean, it's even down to, if you walk in and your dog is chewing up your favorite pair of Nikes and your first reaction is to go out and the dog drops it, you have to go, yay, good puppy. Exactly. And reward them. Yep. You can't correct and then them for it. put your shoes away next time. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> Or set them up to teach them correctly. So this is something important too is uh, how often to do you, when you're working with your clients or you're working with your own dogs, do you set your dogs up for a certain situation so you can teach them the correct way? So I tell people when you're not paying attention, set the dog up to succeed. So when you, you're not home, you're not training the dog, don't leave a turkey sandwich on your table, right? Don't leave your shoes out. Don't set mm -hmm. the dog up where they can self-reward. When you are paying attention, set the dog up to fail. Leave a sandwich on the table where the dog is going to be tempted. Leave, even throw some treats in the dog's shoe. You know, make it tempting for the dog to go stick their nose in that shoe when you're ready and, again, willing and able to add a correction to it. If you don't set the dog up to fail, then the dog is going to self-reinforce because in life you're going to leave a sandwich out, you're going to do something, and the dog is going to get it. Every time the dog jumps up on the table and eats a sandwich, guess what? They're going to try that again. Every once in a while it worked. Again, now we're back to that slot machine. You can try and try and try, but every once in a while, if that pays off, you're going to keep that hope alive. So, again, set the dog up to succeed when you are not paying attention. Don't leave things out. That way, if the dog does jump on the counter, there's nothing for the dog to get. And then set the dog up to fail when you aren't ready. The more failures that the dog makes, the more, the faster they're going to learn and the more they're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's um, kind of interesting how someone will have, you know, a brand new toddler in the house and when they have a brand new toddler that just starts walking they'll follow that toddler everywhere don't touch yep. this don't do that that's sharp don't fall here don't fall here and then what does 90 percent of the population do when they get a brand new puppy they let them free in the house and then <laughs> wonder why they shoot up stuff and pooped on the carpet it's yep. it's insane so if you do treat your puppy because even when dogs are mature adults they still only have the brain capacity of a two to three year old and mm -hmm. that's like a border collie not you know Pug. Not not every dog. Yeah, you said it, not me. I love pugs. I love them too. They're um, sweethearts. But, they're but there's some dogs that are a little bit slower. So you can't expect more out of a dog than you would out of a kid, right? Mm -hmm. But we do. We expect them to make good choices, to know that you're not supposed to chew up electrical cords, that they're supposed to know where they're supposed to go to the bathroom. We expect way too much out of them without showing them what we want. So, again, set your dog up to succeed. If you know your dog isn't potty trained, don't leave them free in your house. And then wonder why, if you're watching them, they don't make mistakes, but as soon as they're free, they do, because you've given them that option. So if, if you use the umbilical cord method, where you keep your dog on leash all the time, and if you're not on leash with them, because that way at least you should be watching them, they're only six feet away from you at all times, um, that does a couple things. 
One, it sets them up to succeed because they can't sneak into the other room and chew up a pair of shoes. They can't, um, you know, jump on people or things or chew things or go sneak into the other room and go potty. You can do two things. You can reward them because you're right there supervising them. If they go to the bathroom, you can catch them in the act and then you can correct and redirect them outside. Um, so you're setting that dog up to not make mistakes or if they do make mistakes, you're there to give them the information that was bad. The problem, like, for example, the potty training is it's a self-reinforcing behavior. If you have to go and you go, it feels good to relieve yourself. Mm. It's a reward. You would never give your puppy a treat for going potty in the house, but you pretty much do if you don't, if they get to go and there's no consequences. And what about what people say? Because this is something that people often say when they say, well, you know, take the dog's nose and rub it in it. If, again, if you don't catch them in the act, there's nothing you can do about it. Slap yourself in the wrist. It's not the dog's fault. Now, if you do catch the dog and you see them going to the bathroom, yeah, yell, clap your hands, do whatever, because you caught them doing it. And again, mark it with a no first, and then apply your punishment, clap your hands, hey, don't stick the dog's nose in it or else you're going to have a poop face puppy and who wants that <laughs> but then take them outside so you want to interrupt it don't let them finish going to the bathroom because then you can't reward them when they finish outside mm-hmm. so if you can catch them when they first start going hey they learned that was bad you go outside you have your treats already on you you don't wait till you get back on the house the dog finishes going you yay puppy party and they get a treat black and white it's bad when you go inside it's good when you go outside and you're setting the dog up to succeed you really with a young puppy if you're taking them out i tell people every two hours Give the dog plenty of opportunities to be right. Now you're creating a a pattern and a habit of if you need to go, you go outside. And if the dog does go when he's inside, again, they're on a leash and you're able to correct them right away. And that does a couple things. It builds your relationship with the dog because they learn to follow you around. It makes you watch your dog because they're only, you know, four or six feet away from you. And then you can reward them. So if they're on leash with you, they lay down, give them a treat. Now you're teaching the dog to settle. If the dog, if somebody comes to the front door, guess what? They're already on leash. You don't have to worry about finding the leash and collar to put on them so that way if they jump on the guest or they run out the front door. You're controlling the dog's everything. And if you do do that too, you don't have to worry about the dog being dominant later because you're controlling all the resources. You're in control of them. And the dog is, you know, so it's just, if, if, if nothing else, one, crate train your puppy and two, watch them like a hawk. Because if you do those two things, you're going to have a great relationship. It's so great you said that because literally my next question was going to be for somebody who says, well, I can't watch my dog all the time. What do I do? Crates. So exercise pen, you know, a small area where they've got their toys that they can chew on, different bones, um, you know, just a small, you know, four by four, no bigger than that. Um, The reason that you want a small space is because dogs naturally are clean. There's always dogs that aren't clean, but naturally dogs are clean. So if you give them just enough space to sleep and play or like in a crate, just enough room to to relax, um, they're not going to go potty there. So now you're teaching them to hold it. But the big thing, especially lately, is natural disasters, right? If you get evacuated and your dog's not crate trained, do you know how much stress you're going to add on to your dog Mm. being in a strange place with, with, you know, in a new place, strange people, loud noises, and being in a container that they're not used to? For the dogs already crate trained, it's like, okay, we're going to go relax here. No problem. It becomes a routine. Exactly. And, so and it's crate's something not a that's, yeah, it's something that's the same in a midst of chaos, which is nice for the dog. And people, a lot of people will think that crating them is a form of punishment, but I mean, dogs are den animals, yep. right? And then after they're potty trained, if somebody really wanted to, they could put the dog in a larger crate or that's when they sure. can start giving the dog the opportunity yeah. To be in the house. And I'm curious to think, I don't know if I ever told you this analogy. It's a new analogy that I came up with recently for the whole potty training thing mm-hmm. because I kept running into more and more people. And I thought this was a technique that had died out a while back, the whole mm-hmm. rubbing the dog's face in. And what I started telling people, I said, all right, look at it this way. Imagine uh, you're a prisoner in a different country mm-hmm. where they speak a different language that you don't understand. And you're in your cell and every day you have, you're afforded the opportunity to use the toilet. And you use it every day, no problem. And one day you're bored mm-hmm. and you start to carve on the wall. And the guards see you carving on the wall and they run in yelling in some language you don't understand. They take your face and they shove it into the toilet. Mm -hmm. And I say, now, do you think that they're shoving your face into the toilet because you use the toilet or because you're drawn on the wall? And they're like, because drawn on the wall. Your dog is not stupid. They know that they went to the bathroom, but they don't understand that's why you're punishing them. It's whatever they were doing when you caught them is what they're associating the punishment to. So it's not like we have dogs that are goldfish and they don't have a memory. So it's just, yeah. it goes back to what we were talking about before, that clear communication. And that's the, the biggest misconception people have too is, oh, the dog looks guilty. I hear that all the time. Oh, the dog got in the trash. They mm. know what they did. 
Well, they actually did a research and they did a study where a person would go into the house, knock over the trash can. The dog didn't even do it. The person would come home, the dog would act guilty. The dog didn't do it. What, what are dogs fantastic at? Body language. Mm -hmm. So they can tell that you're pissed and they know when you make that face, they're in trouble. So they act guilty. That's their appeasement. That's how dogs get out of trouble in the wild too. They, they offer appeasement behaviors. And so unless you caught the dog in the act, and again, set the dog up to succeed, set the dog up to fail, they don't put the two and two together. So even if your dog acts guilty, it's not acting guilty because of the behavior. They just see that you're pissed and they're offering appeasement behaviors to try to make you happy. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's no association. And that, I think that's spot on too. So it is important for people to know that. And, um, again, going to what we were saying, when you are working with your dog, back when I lived up in LA, the analogy I would use since it's in the Hollywood area, I'm like, just pretend it's theater, mm -hmm. right? And before you would go out and do a show for an audience, you practice and you rehearse everything. Mm -hmm. And I say practice and rehearse with your dog. If you have, where you want your dog to act a certain way, like you said, people coming over, mm -hmm. rehearse it. Yep. Right. If you want your dog to act a certain way during dinner time, rehearse what you want them to do. Yep. And going back, they're not psychic. Nope. Right. What are some other common things that you come across that seems to be reoccurring that would be helpful for people to know? So crates are super helpful. And I think every dog should be uh, crate trained. But some people, uh, they use it without training. So they think that just by creating their dog, the dog is learning. And it's not. It's a management tool. So if you crate your dog for eight hours a day because you're at work and you don't want them to get in trouble, okay, that's eight hours. And then the dog sleeps in the crate at night and there's another eight hours. That's 16 hours out of a 24-hour day that your dog is living in a box. Not fair for me. It's not fair. So you need to be training the dog so that way they can have more freedom. So that way you can get to the point where you can leave your dog free without them tearing into things. And that's, again, going back to setting the dog up to succeed and setting the dog up to fail. So you're not going to, the first time you try your dog out of the crate, you're going to give them free run of the house. No. Start with a small room, your kitchen, where you have everything put away, where the dog's not going to get in anything. If they can't behave in the kitchen, they're not ready for the next room. So start in small spaces. Then as your dog gets better, they earn more privileges and freedom. But Building on that success. Yes. How can so A lot of people know how to use toys, when, or not toys, I'm sorry. A lot of people know how to use food when they're working with their mm. dog and uh, and we can go into more depth about that as far as, cause you said something earlier, if your dog lays down, you can reward him for that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's part of that opera conditioning, getting yep. the dog to understand that their behavior has an effect on their environment, which yep. is highly recommended, you know, always keeping treats on yourself yep. when you get a brand new dog. But how can, a lot of people really don't know how to use toys effectively and toys could be incredibly effective. Sure. And even without toys, just play, play with your dog. And a lot of people think, you know, playing tug is going to make the dog aggressive. It's not. All it does is get the dog excited. So if you have no control of, of the dog's arousal, yeah, you can get yourself into trouble. But having the dog bite a toy is not going to make them aggressive. It's just not true. Um, but it's a great way to practice control when the dog is highly aroused. So, again, same thing with going back to the couch. Everything has to have rules to it. So you're allowed on the couch as long as you don't jump up on your own, you wait till be invited up, and you get off when I tell you to. So the same rules are with Tug. So if I have a toy, I don't want the dog just grabbing it because I have it. They need to wait until I tell them, get it, yes, whatever. I invite them to play. And when I tell them to let it go, they need to also respect the rules and let it go. If you don't have that control, that should be your first goal. Because nobody likes to play fetch with a dog that's you're going to throw it once and then the dog runs around the yard and you don't get to throw it again. So to get the dog to let it go, you can try trading. Make sure, you know, if, if your toy is uh, five, make sure that you're rewarding with a seven or an eight. Make sure that you always have something better. So if you throw a tennis ball, make sure that your ball has a squeaker in it. Again, you always have something better. Um, get the dog to let it go. Hi, George. We have a cat that's joining us. This is George. He's very good at training dogs. <laughs> I like George. It's kind of a big deal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, play, play is great because it does two things. One, it teaches the dog control when the dog is highly aroused. It gets rid of some of that energy, um, and it builds a relationship, and you don't have to, you know, keep food on you. You can be like, good job, let's go get your toy. Um, and it's good. Like I said, even with no toys, just play with your dog, run around, you know, pet him, get him all excited, run around, have him do a sit, good dog. And then run away. It doesn't always have to be about the food or about the toys. It needs to be about you and your dog. You always have yourself. You always have your body. You always have your voice. You always have your hands. A lot of people get stuck on not 
petting your dog. They don't, you know, they want to either give the treat or yell at them no, but they never sit there and just massage their dog. Or they do when the dog is doing nothing. The dog's sleeping on the couch and I'll say, let me give you a massage. Well, what did the dog do to earn that? You know, everybody, if, if I were to just pay you for doing nothing and then I wanted you to work for it, you'd be like, why would I work for it if I get it for free? So if you want to use praise and petting as your rewards, if you don't want to have food on you, then don't give it away for free. Don't be like, oh, you're so cute today. No. Tell the dog to sit, then tell them they're so cute and pet them. You know, but if, if you're just giving it away for free, why would the dog ever work for it? How important is imprinting? Because I want to talk a little bit more about the positive training because that's kind of mm-hmm. what everybody pushes is positive. And then I actually, if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit about the correction side and sure. get into a little bit more detail with that. But with imprinting, and what, let's go over what imprinting is because I'm sure people hear it within the pet world, but they really don't know what imprinting is or how to effectively use it and get the most out of those crucial weeks. So you're talking about with very young puppies, correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, there's a, a program called Puppy Culture, and that's what I use to raise my puppies now along with a couple other things. Um, but you start um, obstacles when they're four or five weeks. So teaching them to climb over things, different environmental things. So a lot of people don't realize how much a good breeder will already teach the puppies when you get them in eight weeks. It's not just mom feeds, you know, the mom dog feeds them and then they go home. Um, So we teach the dogs a marker. They know the clicker before they go home. They are exposed to sounds. I'll, you know, cling things together. I'll drop pans. I'll teach your dog to be relaxed around a vacuum. Um, I start teaching them to play. I start little tug games with the puppies. Um, I teach them problem solving. So I'll set up an exercise pin with the food on the other side and teach the dog to problem solve. You can't just get frustrated, try going right or try going left in order to get your reward. Um, They get exposed to tons of people. They get exposed to other animals. They come in the house and they play with the cat. They learn that a hiss and a swat means, you know, with puppies, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. They need to learn boundaries from a very young age. Um, and if they do, they are more adjusted as they get older. And there's even, um, you know, the superstar puppy program and neonatal things that you can do when they're very young, you know, holding them upright and upside down and on warm things and cold things and touching the pads of their feet and things like that to help stimulate and adding small amounts of stress that the dogs are willing or are able to overpass. And that way the puppy has already dealt with how to learn, how to deal with stress, how to problem solve and, and to be socialized before they even go home. Because a lot of people don't understand, and this is one of the biggest problems with vets um, in the U.S., is people tell, tell, you know, people don't socialize your dog until they're done with their vaccinations. Well, guess what? You're missing the key socialization period. From 6 to around 13 weeks, that's when they're little sponges. So you want them to see bikes, skateboards, big dogs, small dogs, you know, people with beards, men with hats, um, you know, strollers, canes, people carrying bags, people wearing hats, anything that they can possibly see later in life, you want to show them. Because after that period, they go through different fear periods. And every dog is different in terms of exact, not exactly at 13 weeks or exactly at 14 weeks, they go through fear periods. Some fear fear periods for dogs is very mild and some is more extreme. But if your dog has seen a man carrying a bag with a beard with a hat on, when they were eight weeks and now they see it during that fear period they're like okay it's kind of scary but i've seen it before mm-hmm. and it's a lot easier for them to overpass it if they've never seen it before they're like oh my god what's that on his face and he's got something on his head and it's harder for them to get over it because now they're first being exposed to it during that fear period and a lot of the vets will tell you don't take the dog out until they're done their vaccinations but you miss that whole period and the I vets would... do that for a reason though because of course sure. if your dog yeah. gets there's, sick i mean there's parvo there's back. lots yeah. of distemper there's lots of bad things that the dogs can be exposed to and this is important to know when you're taking them on your socialize them you're not taking that dog to a dog no park. dog you're parks. not taking that dog to pet smart where there's a nope. lot of dogs you're taking nope. it to places where the likelihood of parvo is very unlikely the, the problem and And the reason why the vets say, and I want to just in defense of like veterinarians, they do it because if a dog does get sick, well, they're on the the medicine side. Yeah, it comes back. They're on the veterinary side. They're on the medicine side. I'm on the behavior and the brain side. Exactly. So, um, yes. So they're not doing anything bad. It's just that that's that's part of the No dog parks ever. If you take anything from this podcast, is don't take your dog to a dog park. Why? Because number one, not all the dogs are friendly. Nobody has control, and nobody's paying attention. So it could teach bad behaviors. You have the risk of your dog getting into a dog fight. You have the getting risk of your sick, dog getting, getting sick. Getting all kinds of things. Have... So if you heard the horror stories that I get of people of my dog was attacked to the dog park or my dog is aggressive, so I took him to the dog park to socialize him or just it's 
Great idea mm-hmm. in theory, horrible in actuality. Do not take your dog to a dog park. Yep. And a lot of people with pets, they do it. Because before I learned about dog training, I took my dog mm-hmm. to the dog I did park. The same thing. And uh, in fact, it taught my golden retriever, who's really, really friendly, sweet dog, to other dogs until he was attacked by three dogs. And yep. then he became very defensive around dogs. Yep. So it's literally his aggression was taught at the dog park. Yep. Or it was know. brought out. Or is brought out, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, he didn't. He wouldn't have presented that, or when no. it came out, it's, had those dogs. Not yeah, gone most out. of the time, and obviously, there's some parks where it's the same five people every single time. And and if all if you know the people and you know the dogs, you know, yeah, socialize your dog. But dog parks are a great place for dogs to either learn how to be a bully or get bullied. And meanwhile, people are like, oh, look how cute they are. They're playing. They're not playing. This dog's being a total jerk, and this dog is being harassed. Mm-hmm. And the problem with the aggression is that it works. So the dog that's getting bullied finally growls or snaps back, and the dog goes, okay, I'll leave you alone. Well, now the dog goes, aha, if you ever get nervous, mom's not going to protect you, but if you growl and snap, you can protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, now anytime a dog even goes near them, they're growling and reacting because a good, you know, the best defense is a good offense. And now you have a dog that barks and lunges anytime they see a dog because they're anticipating getting bullied, and that all started at the dog park. And again, people don't know what to look for, so it's... Yeah, no, no dog parks, but good places to socialize your dog. Um, sit outside a grocery store. How many dogs do you see there? You don't see very many, right? So you're, it's not a high traffic place where dogs poop because that's a lot of times where you're going to pass things down. Mm-hmm. Um, and meanwhile, they hear the noise of the shopping carts, people carrying things. Um, you get all kinds of people there. And most of the time, people are just going in and out. So you don't have a lot of pressure of everybody going, oh, puppy, you know, wanting to come up to your dog. They're going from A to B. They have something to do. They have things that are going to thaw. So they don't have time to come and harass your puppy. Meanwhile, you can expose your dog to that environment. Same thing, sit outside of a Starbucks, um, you know, go to Home Depot. There's plenty of dog-friendly places that there's not too many dogs, or at least dogs that aren't going to the bathroom. But if your dog's going to catch something, they're going to catch something. I mean, Parvo lives in the ground for a very long time. Uh, So does Coccidia. You can, I mean, you step on grass, you walk into your house, your dog picks up your shoe. They just got Parvo. They can even have the vaccine that's supposed to defend against it and still get it. Yep. You know, so I've had that happen to a good friend of mine. And I remember um, we did a fundraiser in order to raise the money to help take care of the dog because he didn't have the money to cover it. And people in the comments were criticizing him for not giving the vaccination. He's like, no, the dog got the vaccine. It just... It could still happen. So there's still always the risk. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say there is don't live your life necessarily as if something's always bad going to happen. Yeah, and yeah, you might protect your puppy when they're small. um, But if now they're fearful and aggressive because they weren't socialized when they were younger and they lived to be 14, but you can't have guests over, it's a long 14 years of Mm -hmm. your life. Or what some people will do too is they'll end up giving the dog up to the shelter because yep. it has these issues that they didn't focus on in the very beginning. Yep. And often it's not by their, it's by no fault of their own because they don't have the information. Yeah, they just don't know any you better. Know? Yeah. And, and, you know, people listen to their vet because it's their vet. Of course they're mm-hmm. going to listen to them. But again, you have to think of it from the medical standpoint. Yeah. You know, you want your dog to be protected before you take them out. But from a mental standpoint, are you not going to take your kid to school until they're 18? Right. Right? If, if the first time you socialize your kid when they're 18 years old, they're going to be either fighting everybody because now they've got their testosterone or they're going to be scared out of their pants because awkward. they haven't, yeah, are super <laughs> awkward. They have no social skills. Um, and, and because you like analogies, I also um, use the dog park as like prison. Mm. Yeah, they're going to meet all kinds of people. They're also going to pick up all kinds of bad habits. Yes. So it's, it's not a good place to socialize your puppy. And um, you said something that made me think of, oh, just talking about the veterinarian or the vet clinics um again i believe that everything that they do say is it's good intent Mm -hmm. right and the socializing side again if something does happen and a vet says yeah socialize your dog then you go back to the vet so i just want to make that clear but then also what i do want to talk about is canine nutrition yeah and i know you know a lot about this subject i know what you feed your dogs and how you take care of them and i want to kind of go over if you don't mind some of the Common misunderstandings. Cats that, are much easier, or dogs are much easier to train than cats. For <laughs> some, the record, <laughs> some of the common misunderstandings that people have when it comes to canine nutrition, what to feed them, what they should probably avoid, and then of course, depending on what some people's budget are, it really restricts what they can and can't do. But what is your general guidance that you give people, like someone who's going to brand new dog? How, what do I do? How do I feed them? How do I take care of them? So. I, I usually tell people, start with, there's a website called dogfoodadvisor.com, and it'll rate all the different dog foods. So if nothing else, you can go on there and, and see 
you know, what did the breeder, what was the shelter feeding them? Because whatever the puppy was already being fed, you don't want to just switch them over to a new food, cold turkey. Especially if you're already dealing with a new environment, the animal might already be stressed. So find out what your pet was eating before, either at the breeder or at the rescue, and then you're going to have to change their food from there. Um, not every dog does well on every food. So even some of the... George. <laughs> Sorry, we have um, cat problems. That's okay, we're not cat trainers. Um, <laughs> not, not every dog is going to do well on every food. Some foods are very rich, and the dogs, don't, even if it's a fantastic food, they don't do well on it. I've tried to feed my dogs a cana and origin multiple times because it's a fantastic food. My dogs don't do well on it. They can't. They get diarrhea. They just don't. It's too rich for their systems. Um, so genetics plays a huge role. German Shepherds tend to have very sensitive systems. So you need to be careful, and if you have a German Shepherd, again, just in general, you're going to have to go slower, you know, in your, as you switch them over to a different food. Um, Are there any certain type of foods that you would avoid or recommend avoiding, like certain things like to look food? for? Uh, not, we could do people food, but like, for example, something I always say, if, the, if you look in the ingredients and it has red five, yellow six, if they're sure. adding different colors, it's probably not a good food. You yeah, know, or so certain if, things if like the that. list is this long, and I'm making a big hand gesture, and you can't pronounce half the things that are on your, you know, the label, just like with people food, probably stay away. Or what's a good way to read the ingredients? So you may not know all the crazy things that are in there that you can't, can't pronounce. So, so just right, like with like, people food, the higher up on the list that it is on, on the ingredients list, the higher percentage it is. So... If chicken or beef is number one, that means that the most of the food is that. If you see corn as the number one, that means that most of the food is corn. Um, dogs are carnivores, but they also would eat whatever is in the, in, in the stomach or the intestines of whatever they're eating. So they do, they can, and again, they're scavengers too, so they can have fruits and vegetables. That's okay for them to eat. Do they need it? No. But can they have it? Of course. Um, you know, there's different vitamins and things that you can give them. Um, you know, ground up the carrots or green beans. If you have a dog that I have a cattle dog, he looks at food and he gets fat. Um, so I can give him some green beans, which is high in fiber, so it can make him feel full without the extra calories. Helping him lose weight. Exactly. So there's there's lots of foods like that that you can give them. Um, you know, carrots are a great snack for dogs. Bananas. Um, but not too many. They just don't like need anything. it. Yeah, but they can have a little little snack um, if you have a dog that needs to watch their weight. Um, yeah, and so someone has a dog who's fat, right? Because a lot of people have fat dogs. A lot of dogs. people do, yeah. How would you recommend for somebody to get their dog to lower their weight in a healthy way? So look at the calories. Just because, and, and look at the bag. So if the if the bag recommends that you feed three cups, it doesn't mean that your dog needs three cups. Just because, you know, every, just like people's metabolism is different, the dog's metabolism is different too. Um, some dogs burn through calories really fast and it's hard to keep weight on them. Like I said, my Australian cattle dog, he gets fat just looking at food. Um, even though he's super active, he just he just holds on to it. So there's some breeds, um, labs, my cattle dog, beagles. There's some breeds that just kind of retain weight. Mm. Um, and unfortunately with the labs, people think they're supposed to look like that, and they're not. Yes, they're not. Um, and, and a lot of people go, well, you know, it's I feed what's on the, ba- it's on the bag. Well, that doesn't mean just because, just like it, People say you just have 2,000 calories does not mean that you would survive on 2,000 calories or that I need 2,000 calories. That's just the general guideline. It's a baseline. So, yeah. yeah. So, I always tell people, start with what says on the bag and then feed them less if they look fat and feed them more if they look skinny and go from there. If you're feeding your dog seven cups a day, there's crap in your food and you need to change it. Um, <laughs> if you're having seven poops a day, again, there's crap in your food and you need to change it. Um, the best bang for your buck is Costco. The purple Costco bag, not even the grain free. The grain free, I think, is the same as Taste of the Wild. I don't know if we're it's, yeah, names, it's, but it's, yeah. it's pretty much the same. So if you want grain free, you can go that route. As long as we're but, saying something good about it. Yeah, but really, the <laughs> Kirkland fun. is the best bang for your buck. They've got a puffy kind, and they've got the adult purple bag, and and that's the best bang for your buck. But it again, is you a can good bang for your buck you for can sure. go on um, the Dog Food Advisor website, and you can look at the different foods and rate them. Um, I've been feeding Victor for a while now too. Um, and that's a really good bang for your buck, and you don't need a Costco card for them. And something I want to point out, too, which you often do, is you will often feed your dogs well. I do, yeah. So I stopped because I had a baby, and my husband doesn't do it right. So if, if you're going to feed raw, you have to do it right. You have to... Do your research. Do your research. Your portions have to be right. Um, so the way that I feed it is 80% meat, um, and then it's 10% bone, 5% um, 
liver. So you did you did the hard work. Yes. So you went, and that's actually you can pr- get it pre-made. The best way, I mean, in my opinion, the best food you could feed your dog hands down is raw when you prepare it yourself. Yep. But the worst you could feed your dog is raw when you prepare it yourself incorrectly. Correct. So your that's dog really cannot important. live off of chicken breast alone. Yes. Yeah. That's no. Yes, it's raw meat, but you cannot live off of that. Just so like if, you said, you could buy pre-made raw for dogs. Yes, you can. Yeah, and I used to use um, was it Happy Happy Dog as a local place, um, and they've got good prices. And it comes in just a tube, mm-hmm. and it's you open it, you put it on the in your plate, and you're done. Yeah. It's, so if you have the budget for it, it's definitely recommended to feed raw. But there are people who just, I mean, if you, you have know, to do it right. Yeah. If you're gonna, you know, but. Feeding raw could cost, what, 300 a month if you're buying pre-made. So it can Usually, be expensive. If, if you do your research, I can get around a dollar a pound if I make it myself. Yes, if you make it yourself. Yeah. Yep. If yep. you're buying it, you're going to be around 350 a pound. Mm-hmm. Um, but the dogs eat less because they're using everything, and the size of the poop pays for itself. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very noticeable, a raw-fed dog, because they have very – very little uh waste mm-hmm. and it's very easy if your bone ratio is correct you have very easy to pick up poops so if it is within your budget i mean it's highly recommended to do yeah. the raw if it's not within your budget kirkland is is a good kibble yeah if you need to to you know kibble but even some and, of the and other victor ones are, is another mm-hmm. cheap you know like cheap uh, good dog food dehydrated is also really nice but again especially for backpacking mm-hmm. it's like anything though the the higher the quality you are going to spend a little bit more yep. uh, but it will increase but you're also the... going to feed less mm-hmm. you're going to feed less with the higher quality and you're also going to spend less on vet bills and that's why i really i i love the fact when i so when um we were training and working together mm-hmm. watching you get all this raw dog food and prepping it for all the dogs i'm like that's so cool because it's, it's so good for the dogs. Yeah, it's it's good for the dogs. It also gives them something to do. I mean, and I fast my dogs when they were on the raw. I'd fast them once a week too, and they just get their meaty bone. A lot of people don't realize that giving the dog system a break is actually very good for them, and a lot of people mm-hmm. overlook fasting. Mm-hmm. So I used to fast once a week because it gives the dog's digestive system a little bit of a break, and of course I give them a, like a big raw meaty bone for them to chew on so they're getting something and they're you know they're starving them um but also your dog is not gonna starve in one day yeah they're not. so a, a lot of people and they go oh my dog's not food motivated i always say well one do you free feed well, yeah because what are your thoughts on free feeding I don't <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's why why would you work for it if you get it for free mm-hmm. that's that's the biggest thing and and if the dog's not food motivated they're overweight they have everything they want for free why would they work for you if you're a millionaire, you're not going to work for minimum wage. You have no yep. motivation for that. So either you need to find something that does motivate the dog or cut back all that free food and, and have them work for it. What about the dog doesn't eat? People say that. I put the dog the food down. The dog doesn't eat it right away. If your dog is healthy, they will eat when they're hungry. So you put it down. They don't eat. What do you suggest? After 20 minutes, pick it up. Beautiful. Love it. Yep. So and offer yep. if you feel bad, offer it again in the evening and give them 20 minutes so they don't eat. Pick it up. A healthy dog can easily go three to four days without eating. Mm-hmm. A lot of people go, oh, they're going to starve. No, they're not. Yep. Especially the dogs who aren't eating. I'm sure they have a nice fat reservoir and they're not going to waste away. Again, this is a healthy dog. If the dog is not healthy, if they have other underlying issues, do not, uh, you know, talk to your vet first. I'm not telling, not every dog can go that long without eating. Obviously play it by ear. Um, but a healthy dog can go a long time without eating. Yeah, and to bounce Just off like that. Just like people. Yep. You're going to be hungry, but guess what? You're not going to die. And there's been dogs that I've worked with in the past where I'm working with the owner and they don't want any sort of corrections. Mm-hmm. And I always respect what the owner wants. If they don't want me to correct the dog, fine. And I always let them know it could take a little bit longer if we're not implementing. Or a lot longer. Yeah, a lot longer. What did I say? A little. Oh, yeah, or a lot longer. <laughs> a lot longer. <laughs> it could take longer. Uh, often it's not as clear. But, you know, in any case... I'll still do it that way. Mm-hmm. And there's been dogs where they are not really food motivated because they're free fed. They're not interested in toys. They don't care if I pet them. And I've gone four days with the dog not eating because I offer the food to the dog and the dog doesn't take it. And I go, great, we'll try again at dinner. Mm-hmm. Dinner comes around. I'm like, you ready to train? The dog says, no. I said, great, we'll try again at breakfast the next day. Yep. And then eventually the dog eats and I let them know there is a possibility we may yep. go a few days. Yeah. And, I, because... and, and you're not, not offering. You're yeah, giving them a chance are. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> They're just not deciding mm-hmm. to eat. You're not starving the dog for 
four days and then trying to feed him, you're offering food twice a day. The dog just isn't hungry enough to take it. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's, I think there's a difference between not feeding a dog for four days and the dog not eating for four days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're definitely not advocating saying don't feed the dog. Yes. <laughs> right? We're saying offer food, but if the dog's not hungry, it's okay. The You're fasting, still offering. The fasting, though, is great. I mean, there is a, um, a really great nonprofit that I'm a fan of. It's called Keto Pet Sanctuary. I know you're familiar with them. And Keto Pet Sanctuary, they help dogs that have cancer. Mm-hmm. And the founder, so she has a couple dogs herself, and she'll often post videos and different things like that. And I remember one of the videos she posted where she's talking about the nutrition because often people overfeed their dogs. And she even said in the video, she goes, I fast my dogs once a week. And it's been proven. I mean, if you look at the dog who has lived the longest, I believe it was an Australian cattle dog Mm -hmm. and it lived 30 years or maybe even 31. It exercised around five miles a day. It ate raw food. It Mm -hmm. drank raw goat's milk and it fasted. It actually self fast is Mm -hmm. what the owner said. You just go days where he just wouldn't eat and it helps with that longevity. And I don't know the details as well as you do or as well as uh, the founder of Keto Pet Sanctuary, but um, it makes a big difference. Sure. And genetics also play a huge role. Mm-hmm. Some some dogs, you know, the farmers go, oh, I fed, you know, X food, which I would normally say is crap food. And the dog lived to be 16. Yeah. Some, some dogs do well on it. Some dogs, you feed them a fantastic diet and they get cancer when mm-hmm. they're six. That's kind of life. Yeah. But if you were going to, to try to get your dog to live longer, just like with people, if you put in good stuff, you're going to get out good stuff. If you, you know, you can't expect a professional athlete to do well just eating popcorn all day. Yeah. They, they need the certain nutrients in order to perform, and yeah. dogs are the same way. That's like those people who've, uh, you know, smoked a pack of cigarettes every day and drink beer every day and live to 100. Yep. You're like, Again, what? That's, that's genetics. <laughs> it's... That's, that's the exception, not the rule. People underestimate genetics. And now I want to mention something too. So um, a lot of people are familiar with my show Rescue Dog to Super Dog mm-hmm. on Animal Planet, but a lot of people don't know that you were one of the behind-the-scenes trainers I was. that make it happen, that made a lot of the pieces come together and made me look better on camera because we have these dogs performing. And the reason why I'm saying that is, so you're a huge advocate of helping dogs in shelters. You've rescued dogs, rehomed dogs, you help people with it, but you also breed dogs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people kind of give the cold shoulder or they, um, you know, have a negative comment about breeders. And what I always tell people is I'm a huge advocate of good breeders. And something that I truly, truly believe in that if only good breeders existed, shelters and rescues would not exist it's true it's so yeah so so a good breeder socializes the puppies before they even go home and and most of the time you're not gonna make any money so a lot of people go oh they just you know they do it for the money or whatever no i don't i do it because i they're they're purposely bred so I'm not just, oh, my dog is cute, this dog is cute, let's throw mm-hmm. them together and have some puppies. So all of my dogs that I breed are health tested. So their hips and their elbows are done, um, their eyes are done. I want to make sure that any genetic issues are addressed. Um, they're titled. So I want to make sure that the dog. What does that mean, titled? So I do a dog sport called French Ring, which is obedience, protection, and agility. So the dogs at least need to have their CSAU, which is like the beginning temperament test that just shows that the dog is social and has basic obedience. Um, but ideally, the dogs are titled higher, especially the males. The females, um, I don't expect as much because when they go into heat and things like that, you can't um, compete with them um, or you have to go last. So it's a little bit harder playing, you know, competing with a female. Mm-hmm. Um, the dogs with more testosterone tend to do better in my sport. So the males doesn't mean that you can't do well with a female, but the males in general are better than the females for this sport. Um, and and I, I don't litter. So all of the puppies on my contracts, when they go home to the people, so I don't let people pick their puppies, I assign the puppies. So you want a dog for search and rescue, you have kids, you want to do this, you want to do that. I go, okay, this puppy would be best for you. I've had them for the last eight weeks. I know their temperament. You're going to go, oh, this one's cute. I want him. No, this dog is a better fit for you. So I assign the puppies to their owners based on the dog's temperament, the owner's temperament, and what their goal is. Mm -hmm. So 
So I'm making sure they're getting a good match. The second thing that I do is I microchip all the puppies in my name. So if at any point the owner I sell to is irresponsible, I get called, I go pick up my puppy. So my puppy will never end up in rescue, or if they are, I'm getting them immediately because I get notified. So the owners can definitely register in their name as well, so they can get their own dog if it ended up in the shelter, but I get notified. Um, the second thing is I have a breeding contract. So people are not allowed to breed their dogs unless, same thing, they title the dog, the dog is health tested, and they're breeding for a purpose. So if they do, they're, you know, they're messing with my contract and I can sue them for, you know, X amount of whatever's on my contract. So it's not just, oh, well, my dog has her first heat cycle. I'm going to breed them. You're not allowed to do that. So I have control not only on my puppies, but on the next generation as well to make sure that only healthy dogs with a good mind are being bred. And you keep in contact with everybody. Yes. Quite often you're friends with these people yep. and you train with them yep. and they give you constant updates yep. too. It's something else that people are blown away at the fact because I often get asked like, so where did you rescue your dogs from? And mm -hmm. I say, all my dogs are from breeders yep. and people are blown away and, it's, and I go over everything basically we just said and it's like, Every single one of my dogs, where I got them from, I still keep in contact with the breeders. I still talk to them. I yep. still train with them if I have the opportunity. And if you are if you find a good breeder, that's exactly what they do. They make sure the dogs are it's healthy. A, it's a relationship. They don't, yeah, it's yep. huge. And just like what you said, which I love, is you said they're these are my dogs. Yep. It's like the, the indiscriminated breeding or the breeding just for profit, they don't care where the dogs go. And that's how they end up in the shelters and they end up in the rescues. And they don't care about the dog's temperament, disposition, trainability. Yep. And that's where we get all the issues. In fact, um, my dog, Ari, uh, so I got her from a good friend of mine. And I trained with him multiple times. And then I found out he had a litter and I was ready for a puppy. And we talked on the phone for an hour yep. before he even considered letting yep. me have one of his dogs. Yep. And then I went out to his training location and we trained together for a week before finally at the end he said, okay, I think you can have one of my puppies. Yep. And, and on my contract too, I don't care if you decide that you don't want your dog at one year or at seven years or if it's 10 years. If you don't want your dog, it's coming back to me. It's never going to end up in the shelter. I don't care what age you decide, oh, I'm moving, I can't have the dog. My dogs will never be in the shelter. I will mm. always take them back. At the same time, good breeders will know, okay, I had 10 puppies this year or whatever. I, I can't be responsible for more than that, so I can't breed more than that. So if I'm having five litters a year and putting out 20 dogs and all of a sudden 20 people don't want their dogs, I have to be in a situation where I can take all those dogs mm -hmm. back. So don't put out more than you can take back, I think is also a, a big deal too um, and that in, people and, don't think about. And good breeders too are also important, not only maintaining integrity of a breed. And when we say a breed, it, it means a dog that's bred for a, a specific job or a specific sure. task, right? And Dogs that are bred for certain jobs, those jobs are not only, I mean, yeah, they're pretty much a necessity for what a lot of these dogs do, but also what some people don't understand. So if we're using Malinois as an example, and we're talking about French ring, French ring was in a sense designed to be a breed standard for the Malinois. Yes, right? it was a breed test. And then same thing if you look at uh, Schutzen, uh, mm -hmm. known as IPO, this was a German Shepherd breed standard test. And it's so... People could say my dog is at the level of what a German Shepherd should be because I have an IPO one, IPO two, you know, et cetera, title on the dog. And these dogs love this type of work. Yep. That's what some people don't understand. I saw this image once where it showed a dog jumping up, and I think it was a German Shepherd doing IPO, which is a protection dog sport. And it's jumping up to bite the do the the uh, decoy's sleeve, mm -hmm. and that's the guy in the. And I'm telling this to the audience, obviously yep. not you, because you know more about protection sport than I do. Uh, but jumping up to bite the sleeve and somebody goes, it's so cruel what the, they make these animals do. It's like that's that dog is that is that dog's happiest, yep. most fulfilled moment is when it is doing that work. I mean, your dogs, your personal dogs, I've seen them out in the field. And when they come out in the field to train with you, they are on cloud nine. Oh, they love it. They are so happy and excited. I mean, I've seen some dogs when they know they're getting ready. I mean, that's a challenge for some of the handlers where when the dog knows they're going to go out in the field and they're going to do the bite work, yep. sometimes it's difficult to keep them in a stay until yep. you allow them because they're so stoked and yep. so excited to go. So and I just wanted to kind of break that myth, right? Yeah, that people and, and that's the difference too between, you know, purpose-bred dogs and pets. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I always tell people, if you want a rescue dog, great. If you want a dog buy from a reputable breeder, great. You should have the choice. I work with a couple different rescue groups. Um, the main rescue that I work with is the Seal Beach Animal Care Center. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got 
four of their rescue dogs that I'm training and fostering right now. Well, you now. helped us get so, Bass. Yeah, and then Bass was from there. So I'm all about rescue dogs, um, and there's nothing wrong with them, just like there's nothing wrong with, you know, buying a dog from a breeder. It should be your choice. The, the problem comes when there's certain groups um, that... Mills are bad, but Puppy right? mills, mm-hmm. um, certain groups like PETA that are trying to push that you shouldn't have a choice. If I've got five kids and I want to make sure, and, and chickens and a horse and three other dogs, and I want a puppy that I know at least from the parents and the parents behind that and the grandparents and everybody is friendly with other animals and with people, and I want a dog that will retrieve or has absolutely no prey drive, it's okay to get a dog from you know, from a breeder if I know exactly what I want and one of my kids has allergies. That's okay to do that. You shouldn't feel bad about getting a dog from a breeder. If you want a rescue dog, you shouldn't feel bad about adopting. It's mm-hmm. your choice. You should have the right. Um, a lot of people, the problem is when people, they rescue with their heart versus their brain. They go, oh, this mm-hmm. one has three legs or this one's been abused. I want this one. Well, this dog has separation anxiety. Are you equipped to deal with that? Some rescue dogs do come with baggage. Not all of them, but some of them do. Just like some puppies, if they weren't socialized, right, or depending on their breed and they have certain traits, they're going to come with some baggage they have to take care of. Mm-hmm. Is a rescue honest with you? That's what I like about Seal Beach is they'll mm-hmm. tell you, Seal Beach is great. This, this dog has this issue. Can you deal with it? And if you can't, well, we have this dog instead. They know all of their dogs. They know all of their temperaments, and they're not going to lie to you about what they have. You get some regular just, you know, shelters that don't know their dogs because the dogs just come in and out and they go this one's cute and they don't know that this dog was surrendered because he was an escape artist Mm -hmm. and he was constantly getting out and that he's been to the shelter five times the owners finally said enough well they have a four-foot fence and now the dog is again out again so there's there's certain things where if the rescue is up front and they tell you about the dog's personality then you should be able to pick based on personality but you shouldn't pick based on oh, this one has a blue eye i want him because he's cute mm-hmm. and especially is... don't bring your kids because then they're like oh well, we want this one and meanwhile this one you know guards or whatever but the kids have already fallen in love with it so now you have to get it so so go with an open you know don't go and talk to the people and say i want a dog that's great with kids i want a dog that's good with other dogs i live in an apartment so i want something that's low energy what do you have mm-hmm. then have the volunteers show you and say you know Fido and Buffy would be great for you. So don't even go and look first. Tell them, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. What do you have that would fit my needs? Don't go and fall in love with a dog that would not be a good match for you because now you're wrestling with your heart versus your brain. Yep. So Doing the have, research. Have a trainer come with you. I don't know why That's more people way. don't do that. Say, tell the trainer, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. Have the trainer go there beforehand evaluate the dog, say, okay, if you're looking for X, Y, and Z, this dog, this dog, and this dog, then you go meet with those three dogs. They're still going to need obedience training, but at least the temperament is there that matches your, your temperament. Just because I want a high drive dog that will go hiking 20 miles a day for six months does not mean that would be a good pet for you in your apartment. Mm -hmm. So pick, pick based on what you want, what your goals are. If you're hoping to get into shape and so you want a high energy dog, that's going to make you go running. No, no, no. Go running first. Once you have that pattern and that habit, then you can add that high energy dog. But if, if you if your diet fails or you don't keep up with it, now you have this high energy dog that's going to drive you crazy because you're not a good match. Mm-hmm. Doing the and that's going to prevent you from having heartbreak later. Of you course. know, I mean, making sure we didn't. And uh, so some people also they they may want to. And I just want to share a quick little story. One of my buddies, uh, he wanted to rescue a dog. He reached out to me. He said, you know, my birth uh, my daughter's birthday's coming up. Mm-hmm. And she really wants a corgi, so I want to get her a corgi. And I said, so you're looking for, I mean, the likelihood of me finding a dog in the shelter that's a corgi. Sure. It, within, a, I'm like, how long do we have? And yeah. he goes, oh, her birthday is in a month. <laughs> I said, well, the likelihood of me finding one is slim yeah. to none. I said, if you really want to get her a corgi and that's what she wants, get it from a breeder. And he was kind of opposed to that at mm-hmm. first. He says, well, I really want to rescue a dog. There's a lot of dogs out there. And I said, you know, if you're getting something specifically for what you need, there's nothing wrong with getting it from a good breeder. Yeah. And I said, and if you really want to help out and you want to do something, then just support uh, a donation. few dogs being rescued. Yeah. And, and he f- helped fund the rescue of multiple dogs after yeah. that. He paid for, I mean, he has good money Sure. and he paid for that. And then he rescued the dog and, um, I remember I picked up the dog for him and I'm getting ready to bring the dog back and somebody sees it and they go, oh, that dog's from a breeder. Mm-hmm. And they gave this look and it's like, yeah, the, then the guy who's given this dog a forever home also funded the rescue of like five other dogs, yep. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, and, and honestly, it's none of their business. 
Yeah. If, if, true. If, again, this is America. I think everybody should have the choice. If you want a rescue dog, go rescue your dog. Mm-hmm. If you want to get it from a breeder, get it from a breeder. People should not feel bad about their decisions because people see, you know, and I've got two puppies that I bred and that's in my litter, but they don't know that I have four foster dogs that are all from mm-hmm. rescue. You know, or they see my foster dogs like, oh, yeah, well, breeders are bad. Well, you didn't know that I had a litter, did you? Yeah. So it's not every breeder is bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as the breeders are responsible, of course, there's bad breeders, just like there's bad rescues. Of course. Yep. You know, and there's bad owners. That doesn't mean that they should all be, you know, that doesn't mean that they're all bad. Mm-hmm. Really, George? And even, uh, you know, just like you helping, because you do help uh, Seal Beach um, Animal Rescue. And then my buddy who bred Ari, my, mm-hmm. my Malinois, I remember I was at his place and he's like, you know, it's I he he's like my heart's always broken because I have all these dogs that were unable to find these homes for because they have issues and and he never wants to give up on any dogs, yeah. you know. So somebody who is a breeder doesn't make them because again I, I hate when people do that like oh breeders it's like such a huge advocate of good breeders. Yeah, and my big thing too is everybody also um, you know they pushes spay and neuter at a young age. Um, and there's been shown sign or there's been studies that have shown that they can have issues with their developmental and their skeletal growth and tendons and ACL or I guess in dogs at CCL tears and things like that if you can't be responsible and keep your dog on your property of course spam and neuter them early if you can I usually tell people wait till at least a year now and again that's up to you and your vet but if then again if you can't be responsible and keep your dog from jumping the fence and knocking up your neighbor's dog then do it as soon as possible but if you can be responsible and again, talk to your vet. I tell people wait at least a year now. That's a good way. So they mature and they get mm-hmm. all the, uh, you know, like for the male, the testosterone that they need to yep. develop properly. Yep. What are your thoughts on different sort of training collars and corrections? And I, I, I know what your thoughts are, yeah. but I want you to share. Everything has, <laughs> everything has a place. Mm-hmm. And, and again, that goes back to the art of dog training. So um, I know how to use gentle leaders and halties and clickers and pinch collars and harnesses and um, remote collars and pinch collars and choke chains and flat collars and martingales and the front clip harnesses. Everything has its place. The the problem is when people use the tools incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So even just a flat collar, if you're letting your dog drag you around, you're gonna do damage to the trachea. So that's not good. If the collar is just for their ID tags, sure. If if you're using a harness and you're complaining that, you know, the kinds that clip on the back of the dog and you're complaining that the dog pulls, well, of course, those harnesses are designed to make it the most comfortable for the dogs to pull. That's why we use them in the protection to build drive. And that's why they use them in sledding to, so that way the dog has the most power or weight pull. So that way the dog has the most power to pull. Mm. If you're complaining that your Husky is pulling you and you're walking in a harness, I go, well, of course, that's what it was designed for. Um, Everything has, uh, you know, like I said, it's purpose. Everything has its use. It's the incorrect use. So I've seen people with pinch or prong collars on the dog and the dog is just dragging through it. Well, that dog has those prongs on its neck and it's doing absolutely nothing. So it's not being useful. I have seen some people... Um, or it's too large. It's too they large. That's, it the the biggest, <laughs> that's the biggest mistake that people make is they don't use the tools correctly. So it would no matter what tool you're going to use use it correctly that's and we live in a time and age now go on youtube look it up Mm. you know look up a couple different to make sure you're not just looking at a bad trainer because there's plenty of bad training videos on youtube um but see how you're supposed to be using it or actually read the directions but everything has a use and everything has its downside so most of the time um i'll either use a martingale so that way the dog can't slip out of it i use the the british slip leads again the dogs can't slip out of it just for moving dogs from a to b Um, I use pinch collars a lot. I will use harnesses on puppies because I just let them drag me around. I don't worry about obedience. I just let them explore a lot of the times with the young puppies. Um, I use remote training collars. Um, What are some of the misconceptions with remote training collars? Because that is a big one. Sometimes people hear it and they go, oh, you use shock collars. Yeah, shock collars. So in the olden days, it was shock, the dog's jumping out of its skin, and the dog yelping and jumping even higher. That there was the only level. So before, yes, they were shock collars. The dog would be shocked. They didn't know where it was coming from, and they were very high corrections. The collars that we use nowadays, most of them have either 100 or 127 different levels. So you can find exactly where the dog feels it, and most of them are the same like a TENS unit that you'd use for physical therapy. Um, again, every tool has its place. If I just put the collar on and start pushing buttons, it's not going to teach the dog anything. What teaches the dog is after I've done my foundation, I've already taught the dog using food. 
I've already taught the dog what the leash means, and then I just layer that over. So they go, oh, that kind of feels funny, but everything else is the same, and they understand that it's exactly the same thing as a leash. And if you do it right, the dogs don't have a bad association with it. My dogs, when they see their remote collars, they know that we're going hiking, we're going to the beach, we're going to the park. They know that we're going to go do something fun. And they get excited. They get excited, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with the remote collar, too, um, what it predicts. So if it gets to that point, like you said, it starts to predict something fun. It could be seen as something fun. But what causes a lot of the bad or negative side effects that people have there there for example there was this article that i read a while back and it was titled the shocking truth to shock collars mm-hmm. right and the the person who wrote the article is saying that you know a dog on a remote collar will hunker to the ground their ears will be back they will be more nervous when the person with the remote comes in the room mm-hmm. right and there is a reason that causes this yeah bad training and, right <laughs> so uh, can you go into detail like how that actually happens? So um, if I just put the collar on the dog and say I was going to try to stop a behavior. So the remote collars can be used for two things. So you can use them for positive punishment or you can use them for negative reinforcement. And this is operant conditioning terms. Um, for negative reinforcement, that's usually a low level. So that's where the dog's like, huh, that kind of feels funny. Positive punishment is that you need to stop that behavior. Yeah. So a lot of people will use the remote collars um, as positive punishment for uh, jumping on the counters, stealing food, getting in the trash bag, rattlesnake avoidance. That's where people would use it at a higher level to stop behaviors. Um, so what exactly are they doing? So like for rattlesnake avoidance, that's something that is the, an issue dog, in California? Yeah, right? so, so rattlesnakes can definitely do a lot of damage and can kill your dog. So the pain that... You, you pretty much want to associate the rattlesnake with pain. That's that's what it is. When people say that the remote collars don't cause pain, oh, sure. Put it on 127 and put it on your arm. It's going to hurt. It's not going to do any damage, but it's definitely going to get your attention, and, and you're not going to like that. And that would be an application to use it at the high level is for Correct. that rattlesnake yep. avoidance. It's yep. such a I, high I want them to avoid it. So they see a rattlesnake, and they have that neuro association that – that's bad. Rattlesnake means, ouch, avoid Get the it rattlesnake. Away. Yeah, exactly. And instead of ha- having them actually be bit by the rattlesnake yep. and either die or nearly die and get yep. really sick, we set them up for that in yep. order to help save their life. Exactly. And, and that's kind of the same as vaccinations. They hurt, right? Getting poked with a needle, I hate it. It's, it, it hurts. You're causing pain to your dog. But why do you do it? Because you're going to save their life. Mm. So that's the same thing with the rattlesnake avoidance training is, yeah, it's going to hurt. But you're also going to potentially save their life. So it's a, a moment where when young puppies, you give them a shot, they're like, ah, they yelp, they make a big deal, they don't like it. But you're doing it because it's good for them, because you're trying to save their life. So that's the same application that you would be using for the rattlesnake. Yeah, it's going to hurt for a second, but it's going to potentially save their life later. And I like that you said the opera conditioning, too, because... We defined it later as uh, earlier, rather, as far as a dog who understands that their behavior Mm -hmm. has an effect on their environment. So if you're doing that on the correction side as well and you do it correctly, as you said, basically what ends up happening is a dog learns what behaviors Mm -hmm. create the corrections. And by using the negative reinforcement, as you said, it also also teaches them how to prevent it and turn it off by complying. So then therefore the fear that is associated with the bad use of correction that was in that article, the shocking truth, the shock collars goes away because the dog knows what to do, knows how to prevent the correction and knows how to stop it. Exactly. So the the big thing is the dog is in control. If the dog is not in control, that's where you get the shock because they don't know where it's coming from. And that's again, where you get bad training. That's when you get the dogs that hate wearing their collars or they see and they go, and they start to sulk. It's because of bad training. So I, almost every single dog that comes in, unless the owner specify or the dog's not doing off-leash stuff, I use a remote training collar for cum. It's a distance thing. I can, you know, I can carry around a 50-foot leash, but what happens when it's 100 Mm -hmm. feet? What happens when the dog is 200 feet away? And at the dog beach where there's other dogs, I have to be like, oh, be careful. And meanwhile, this dog flips over the line and hurts themselves. I want to make sure that I have a way to communicate with the dogs, hey, I'm over here. And just enough to get their attention and to teach them the same thing, that as soon as you turn in my direction, you turn off that pressure. You're in control of it. Um, and even if you look back at the old gun dog training, you know, when they did the forced retrieve with their remote collar, they're pretty hard on those dogs. But by the end, those dogs are happily grabbing mm-hmm. that bird. Why? Because they're in control. It's a little bit of stress while they're learning. And again, now we know that we can do it a lot, a lot softer and still get the same results. But as long as you're consistent, as long as the dog understands that they control the consequences, and this is for everything, 
you're going to get a happy, confident dog because they know what to expect next. Confident, right? Yep. Contrary to what everybody thinks yep. as having the submissive, yep. you try to get a confident dog. Exactly. I want confident and reliable. I want a happy, reliable dog. Out of all the dogs that come through my training or that I work with the owners, I want the dog to be happy and reliable. If the dog is happy but unreliable, that's a dog that's dead in the middle of the road because they didn't listen to you and they got hit by that car mm-hmm. chasing the cat or whatever. Um, and I've seen you work with dozens of pet dogs that you've had mm-hmm. come in when we were training together and all the dogs that you used a remote collar on across the board were really happy except if the dog already had fear issues or issues like that and then you would work with it a different manner but all the dogs are super happy super stoked yeah. excited to work with you yep. and incredibly responsive yep. and and my, one of the re, one of the ways that i use them here is in my social groups so when you've got two and a quarter acres of property and I'm turning the dogs loose into a large area, I can't be chasing everybody with a squirt bottle. <laughs> One, my timing is horrible and I would look ridiculous and I have a horrible aim. So when I'm dealing with large groups of dogs together and I see that this dog is starting to, to be a punk and this dog is guarding a tennis ball, I need to be able to reinforce my commands at a distance in order for that group to be safe. So a lot of times I don't use them, but if I know that I have a dog that has a tendency to maybe provoke other dogs or sometimes a little bit pushy or has any kind of issues, it gives that dog the freedom to be in that group, but it gives me the control to know that the other dogs are going to be safe. And often, you correct me if I'm wrong, but with a lot of the dogs that you would teach with the remote collar, you would often have them even wearing the collar for days Without before using even it. ever using yep. it. And what value does that add? It just teaches the dog that the collar doesn't mean anything. So if I slap the collar on the dog and start correcting things, yeah, you can make a bad association. If I put the collar on the dog and we go for a walk, I take it off. I put the collar on and we go out for our playtime, I take it off. I put it on them, I scratch their butt, I take it off. The collar's no big deal, just another piece of equipment. If the first time I put it on, it's for rattlesnake avoidance training, yeah, I can make a bad association yeah. <laughs> with the dog not wanting to have that put on. Um, the other important thing that a lot of people have the misconception um, that happens is the dogs get burn marks on their skin. So if you leave the collar on the same spot for too long, you can cause pressure necrosis. Some dogs have very sensitive skin and they get it very quickly. Um, some dogs, you can leave it on them for a few hours and they have no marks. Um, and that's just like if your shoes are too tight, you can cause a blister. If they're too loose, you can cause a blister. So usually every two or three hours, I'll switch it either from the right or the left on the dog's neck to make sure that it's not rubbing for too long. Um, because some dogs that have very sensitive skin, you can cause irritation just from the dogs wearing it. Um, and collars get a bad, bad, uh, bad name that way as well, because they think that the electrics, the electricity, uh, cause that on the dog's neck and it's not, it's just like, cause it's a muscle stimulator. Yeah. It, it's not yeah. going to cause any physical damage to the, and if somebody was interested in using one of those training collars and they weren't local mm-hmm. to where they could work with you directly, what would you recommend for them? Um, I do, I mean, we can do video Facebook chats, things like that. I can do video where I can send it to them. They can send it to me or I can usually refer either some different YouTube videos or um, a trainer in their area. And that's a good point too to make because a lot of trainers, so a lot of dog trainers know other dog trainers and going to the, back to the sport, French ring and French ring in my opinion is arguably one of the most challenging dog sports out there. And and there are dog sports, for example, that may be easy, you know, because I don't want to say that other ones for example, they're different. Uh, yeah, like agility, for example. I always tell people if you have a dog that enjoys agility, teaching agility is easy. But if you want to compete at the top level, yeah. is I mean, I can't think of the name of the dog trainer's name, but she's won worlds in agility like three different times. And watching her videos, it's mind blowing yeah. how good this woman is at training. And to try to beat her is damn near impossible. Yeah. Right? But just French ring in general, just getting to the point of having a dog that can do an entire ring one routine yep. is incredibly hard. And I think it takes some of the top skilled dog trainers the, the, to be the able to do that. The biggest thing with French ring, especially at the higher levels, is it's 45 minutes with no rewards, no corrections. And no training collar on the dog. The dog is, has nothing on them, and you have nothing. I mean, you can have a vest, but no toys, no balls, no collars. There's nothing. It's you and the dog. Mm-hmm. So that's a very long time, and the dogs usually learn pretty quickly if your training is bad or if they're really smart when a trial is and that you have no control over them. And if, if you don't have a good relationship with the dog, they can blow you off pretty mm-hmm. easily. With agility, it's very fast. There's lots of behaviors very quickly, but you're done, you know, it's, even the longest course is less than, you know, a few minutes. 
So, but it's it's fast, 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 mm. fast, and the dog gets their reward very quickly. Forty five minutes is a long time. It is. And all the sports at the top level can present different challenges. Sure. And the reason why I was saying that was because of you being so active mm-hmm. within the French ring community has put you in a position to know dog trainers across the entire country that compete in the sport. Yep. I mean, you've traveled for the sport. Uh, you've been to France for the sport, right? Yep. I mean, literally have gone to the country where it started. So that gives you the ability to know trainers in different areas. So if you were to have somebody reach out to you and maybe you weren't able to help them from here, you could direct them sure. towards a trainer that yep. you've worked with before that you know has credibility and has experience to deal with their situation. Uh, but yeah, definitely if somebody wanted to reach out you to do a Skype video or something like that. Yeah. So if you're not comfortable using a, a training tool, don't use it until you are. So if you would like to get into remote collar training because you go hiking with your dog and you want them to be off leash um, and you want to make sure that you maintain that control, don't just slap on a collar and start pushing buttons. Make sure that you have done your research and you know how to introduce it and you know you know, the, the ins and outs of how to use it before you ever use it with your dog. So the dogs that come through here that do go home on remote collars, I train, I put the collar on the person, I have them hold it in their hand and I train them first. So they see what it feels like. Don't, I would never do anything to your animal that you're not willing to do for, to yourself. Darn so right, I make, I, I make them put it in their hand. I make them, I show them when I turn it on, when to turn it off. Then I have them train me. I can tell them if their timing is bad. I can tell them, you didn't do it right. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. The dogs can't tell them that. Mm -hmm. So until they are comfortable and they're confident and they're using it correctly, they're not allowed to use it on their dog. Because again, that's where you can make problems because timing is important. Yeah, I have couples train on each other. Yep. And they usually love it. Yeah. (laughs) All right, so actually I got some more questions. They came to my mind. Uh, People who want to be, I know we briefly hit it a little bit on the beginning, but uh, people who maybe want to be dog trainers Mm -hmm. and different avenues that they could take to get to that, maybe avenues for those that have money to attend schools Mm -hmm. or different routes that people could take if maybe they don't have the financial backing to go to school. What different recommendations would you give them? And you can recommend anything. You can recommend other companies, whatever you want on here. I mean, there's no restrictions. I tell people... Find somebody that you, you know, that's obviously close because the more that you work with them, the more that you're going to learn. So and you're, you taught a couple people to yourself. Like you've had yeah. apprentice programs where yeah. you had people live with you for an extended yep. period of time. Yeah. So if you're driving four hours to work with somebody every day, you're not going to go five times a week or you're not going to be able to go after work. So find somebody who's local to you or is drivable because the more that you go, the better off you're going to be. So if you only go once a week to learn, it's the same thing with doing private sessions. If I come out to your house once a week and that's the only time the dog is trained, we're not going to make very much progress. Mm -hmm. You have to be practicing every day with your dog, even if it's only 10, 15 minutes. As long as you're getting those repetitions in, we're able to make progress. So make sure that you're working with somebody that's close enough that you can go frequently. That's the biggest thing. Um, Make sure that, again, you see results. If If they're not... Some people can be great dog trainers, but they're horrible at explaining things. Unless you're really good at just watching and picking up things, you're not going to learn as well. So make sure that the person, you know, if you can, ask to sit in on one of their private sessions and watch them coach somebody and say, okay, I can learn this way um, or whatever. And find out what your passion is. So if you love agility, find somebody who does agility. If you like the protection stuff, find somebody who does the protection stuff. How would somebody, that's, that's, uh, I'm glad you said that. How would somebody find a way to get involved with agility or a way to get involved where maybe they're not going to break the bank because some of these places that will offer agility for normal clientele mm-hmm. because they're a business it's going to be too expensive to learn the actual skill set to be a so, trainer for that so, so, so how find would they out so most like the people that come to me I either charge them very little or they work for it mm-hmm. so they help clean the kennels they help me feed dogs they help uh, you know, exercise the dogs, they take them on walks. I like having an extra hand. It's good for the dogs to, you know, once they're at a certain point in their training to have another person who doesn't know what they're doing handle them because that's going to be their owner. And if they're not used to handling, you know, working under different people, they're going to be bad when they go to their owners because the owner's going to make mistakes. So by the time the dog is done with me, if they've already practiced with two or three other people, it's a lot easier for the dog to transition back home. Um, so yeah, and that's I mean, good experience for the human who's learning how to be a dog sure. trainer. So, so my big thing is be willing to scoop poop, be willing to clean, <laughs> be willing to well, I you still know scoop wake poop, up. So yeah, everybody scoops poop. Be willing to clean out dirty crates. Be willing to do the the nitty gritty stuff that needs to be done um, for your education. Because a lot of times you can, depending on the person, you can get free internships. A lot of people will do that mm-hmm. in order to have that extra help. 
because either they're paying somebody else or that's taking time away from them or if there's two people cleaning up after the dogs it goes a lot faster and people can learn a lot that's what i was actually trying to get you to say as far as because you mentioned uh different training clubs Mm -hmm. how can somebody get involved maybe with an actual agility club or a French ring club. Cause yeah, even so, French ring, they hear protection, right? But yeah. it's a lot of obedience, oh, yeah. you know, and you yeah, can so learn. Go, you can go to ringsport.org. Um, and those, there's a club list on there that you can find something in your area. The same thing with the different agility groups. You can Google agility in your area or protection training even or even AKC just obedience. Or, yeah, AKC, yeah. Anything that you're interested in, go on Google. You can read reviews if you want, um, find something that's nearby and then just call people. Mm-hmm. And, And my big thing is I would rather have somebody who didn't have any money to pay me but was super motivated. If you want to show up every day or when you can to come and learn, I I want to help you learn. If I have somebody who wants to pay me but they only want to come once a week and they aren't really motivated, don't waste my time. So I would rather have somebody who has no money but has the same passion. I would rather work with them than somebody who wants to pay me but they don't really care. Or they say they care but they're not practicing at home because I can tell. It's that hard work. And you 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 guys have your own club here, right? Yeah. That's what I th- so uh, what a lot of clubs will do, and again, I'm telling this for the audience, sure. <laughs> uh, they'll have club fees. But if you look at a club fee, those prices are – way less than if you were to go to a place to learn how to, to train your dog. And the club fees are usually there to help cover the cost of the field and the training equipment yep. and all these different things that are needed. Uh, do you guys have a club fee? You don't have to say what it is. If yeah, you we, ha- we have a club fee. Um, and then it just depends if you come once, twice, or three times a week. Um, usually our club days on Sunday mornings. And we live in Southern California. So most of that money goes to trying to keep a green grass on our field. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, replacing the sleeves, the hosting jumps. Hosting trials. Hosting trials. So. Having people come in from France to give seminars and things like that. We really don't make any money on the French ring. It just kind of pays for us to have that it's club. It's passion. Exactly. Yeah. And that's with a lot, what I've experienced too. That's with a lot of the clubs, the Schitzen or the IPO clubs, even you know PSA or Mondio Ring. Now these are all the protection sports, but even the AKC clubs and yep. things like that. A lot of the people, and that's why it's so good to seek out a club if you want to be a professional dog trainer and you may not have the financial backing to go to a school that costs fifteen grand. You can go to these clubs and you're working with people who share that same intense passion. Yep. And the beauty about it, because even coming from you know being and going through the school and having my own business, every single club that I've worked with and the people in the club, I've learned a great deal from. So even having a background, you can learn stuff. And I'm sure every time you train with somebody new, you might pick up yep. a new piece of information that increases your ability to train more effectively. Yep. And a lot of people look came out to a club and they talk. Don't talk to your neighbor. Watch the dog that's on mm-hmm. the field. Ask questions of, you know, when the dog is done, don't interrupt training. But when the dog is done, why did you do this? How did you teach your dog this? Every dog is different. Everybody has their methods for, for doing certain things. But the more the more tools that you have in your toolbox, the more methods that you have for teaching an exercise, there's going to be a dog that your this method doesn't work, but this one does. And you have to be able to adapt again. That goes back to the art of dog training is to be able to change your methods for each dog in each situation mm-hmm. because not every dog is the same. Um, if somebody's not near a club or uh, they don't have the means to even pay the club fees, mm-hmm. Is there any sort of online things that you might recommend? Really, there's some really good training on YouTube. If you if you know what to look for, and you can either send myself or Nate a message, and we'll point you in the right direction. Because um, I don't I don't know everybody's links to their pages, but there's plenty. If you want to learn purely positive for you know everything, I can point you to a web page, you know YouTube page that has from leave it to walking on a leash to aggression to everything. Now again, I'm not going to use every method that this person provides for everything but it's good to know same thing if you want to use remote collars there's a different page that i would send you to that walks you through all the steps to how to use a remote collar for x y and z if you're into aggression i can send you to this person who has some really good how-to videos on how to do aggression at home Um, but there's also all kinds of junk online so i do not recommend you go home and you google dog training heel You know, because you can find all kinds of stuff and you can really mess up your dog. Just like if you listen to the barber who knows how to train your dog, don't listen to him. Do the research. Know the the theory behind the art. Because if you don't know the whys, it's very hard for the application. Um, But at the same time, I know lots of fantastic trainers that don't know what operating classical conditioning means. Mm -hmm. But they've been in it for so long, they know exactly what they're doing and they're phenomenal training trainers. I know some trainers who click five times before they give a treat and they have fantastic results at trick training. 
because they have their method, they stick with it, and they're consistent. So it's, it's not necessarily about method. Again, it's going back to results. And do you see the results? And learn as many different methods as you can. And just make sure that you know, if you're watching garbage, that you know that it's garbage. Mm. Yeah, and there are a lot of videos, just like you said, that pop up and it has incorrect information. And I've seen them a hundred times. I've even seen ads that have popped up because, yep. of course, the way that they use on these YouTube pages and things like that, it's that target marketing. Yep. So if you look up a dog video, ads are going to end up popping up. Yep. And I constantly look up different dog videos. Um, now, I actually, so talking of online, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're, are you a fan of Michael Ellis? So I always direct people like check out Michael Ellis's dog yeah, very, videos as well. Very, very good explanations. Very patient. Mm -hmm. um, the videos that are out there also show lots of mistakes that the people make. Um, and he breaks which, it down beautifully. Exactly. So yeah, he's he's a very good resource, and he has a school as well. He does. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Forrest Mickey. Mm -hmm. He has some good stuff like Healer's Toolbox. I've even suggested Healer's Toolbox to people who want to know just some of the basics. Yeah. Up front. And Did you go through that program? Did you? No, I didn't. But there's also a program um, called Bow Wow Flicks. Dot com and it's Netflix for dog training seminars. No kidding. Yep. I actually haven't can, heard of that. <laughs> you can go online and you can put, okay, I want two videos at a time or three videos, and they have Michael Ellis. They have, I think they have Forrest Mickey. They have Ivan, I'm going to butcher his last name, Babalov. Babalov, yeah. yeah. Um, they have uh, Dr. Patricia McConnell. They have uh, Sophia Yin. They have um, Ian Dunbar. Bridget they have, Carlson. I don't know about that one, but they have. I would like to see some videos have, that she does. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but there's all kinds of videos on there. So if you want to learn, and again, you have to be able to watch and be able to retain things and then apply. So everybody's going to have their guinea pig dog that they're going to make lots of mistakes on. Um, but yeah, bowwowflix.com. It's like Netflix about dog training seminars. So well, I'm not able to go and travel to a lot of seminars anymore because I have my business here. Mm -hmm. I have a kid now and husband and plenty of my own dogs. So I can't travel. So that allows me to go to seminars without actually physically having to leave. Um, and pick and, and choose what you like, yep. right? I mean, you know, there's, uh, what's the saying? There's nine ways to, or 12 ways to skinny. What's the saying? There's oh, more man, than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, more than one way. Thank you. <laughs> there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? So there's different ways and, you know, pick what you like. Pick and choose. You don't have to say like, okay, I like this person, so I have to do everything they do. No. Pick and choose what works for you. Yes, and expand your toolbox. So... So my big thing, too, is when people go, oh, well, I want to do this method. And I go, well, I understand that method because I've seen it before, but this is the problem with that method. Instead of going, well, I don't like that method. Mm -hmm. So if you've seen it, even if you don't agree with it, you can go, I know what you're talking about, but the problem with that method for your dog in this situation is this. And it could be good with other dogs. Exactly. But if you're not even familiar with the method, you can't say that it's bad mm. because you're, you don't have any experience with it. You know, and that person might want to use a clicker for their dog for dog aggression. And I might go, well, yes, let's use bat for this dog because you, you have 10 acres before you'll see another dog and you can work your threshold. But most of the time, the problem with bat, as a program, um, is, is thresholds. If you leave your house, some dogs are over threshold. If you have neighbor dogs that bark. So what are you going to do? Not walk your dog? So that's, and again, if you don't understand the program, you can't say, well, yes, but that program wouldn't work for you and your dog because of this. Or just because I can go on a walk with, like I said, a, a tree and a clicker and a food bag does not mean that this other person is going to be able to use all those tools. Just because I can use a remote collars, there's lots of clients I would never give a remote collar because yes, they, can't, <laughs> they can't use it correctly. And so, again, the the possible damage that the person could make would way out risk the possible rewards. So, and again, that goes back to the art of knowing what method to use with each client to help them reach their rewards. Just because I can do something does not mean that you can do it. And just because you can do something doesn't mean that I can do it. You know, it doesn't mean that you're bad and I'm right or vice versa. That just means that you have to be able to be willing and able to change your method in order to help that person and their dog. And if you're stuck in the purely positive, even though that's not even real, yeah, because they method. use negative punishment. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if that's what your goal is, you're adding limitations. And again, that goes back to being selfish. You're putting your desires above your dogs. And for me, that's not fair. And you did just mention seminars as well. And mm -hmm. seminars, I think, is a great way for somebody to learn. What's a good yep. way for somebody to find seminars? Um, you can, again, go to your the training clubs. We'll post, like we just hosted a seminar on um, genetics and things like that. Um, you can go to... Like I said, I think the website is Tazerdog, T-A-W-Z-E-R dog.com, -E -E and they record a lot of the seminars, and I think they have a seminar list 
Um, I think if you go on Ian Dunbar's uh, website or it's the Association for Professional Dog Trainers, I believe they have a list of upcoming seminars as well. Um, so if or you can contact contact me and I'll I'll send you a link. I'll try to find it for you. And speaking um, of, how can people find you? What are all the different ways people could find you? So, I'll also put it in the description. But yeah, so um, my website is phdogs.com. Um, I have not updated it in a long time, even though my my guy did a long time ago. I have never uh, updated it. So where it says ju- or a group class in November, that's only right once a year. Um, as we pass that. Um, but your number and everything. Yeah, on everything's there. on there. Yeah, you can Google us, phdogs. It'll pop up. Um, we have our Facebook page. I think it's Facebook dot com slash ph dog training instagram i believe is ph dogs yeah instagram is ph dogs um my phone number is online um yeah i'm if you google ph dogs you'll find me so definitely everybody reach out if you're in the area if you're in the riverside area she will not let you down i promise you that last thing any um dog books you recommend i know you have like 50 in that room over there yeah i have a pretty big library (laughs) it just depends um so, um, gosh, Ian Dunbar is, is one of the best. Um, I think we should start counting how many times the cats jumped on the table. Yeah, she's fine. Um, Ian or Dunbar, uh, was one of the first who pushed early socialization. Um, he was one of the first ones that said, let's not wait till they're a year. Let's start training puppies. Um, and that was in the sixties. And so he's been very influential. Um, Patricia McConnell, She's an ethologist. She's fantastic. She's got lots of really short books on like separation anxiety, dog dog aggression. Um, Sophia Yin is another great one. Um, I have all kinds of competition obedience books that I like, and I can't remember the names of them. Um, Pamela Reed is fantastic. If if no other book, read Accelerated Learning by Dr. Pamela Reed. She's really good. Um, and explains learning theory and everything like that, which is great. So that's over two hours, believe it or not. So I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. Mm -hmm. You are awesome. You're a phenomenal trainer. I've learned so much from you and I hope everybody else who listens to this has the opportunity to learn something of value as well. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. (laughs) 